I think there are many things happened as well as the development of the 5G standards, uh, which maybe arguably wasn't developed with necessarily with service provider and EMBB in mind. EMBB is one of the use cases. So it's for enhanced mobile broadband. Yes, yeah? kind of the smartphone business. Yeah. Basically fatter pipe, more yeah. bandwidth. Yeah, it's kind of clever pipe. But then, oh, okay. then things happened in, or developed in, in, in the meantime, which is... Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. We were just saying before we started filming that me and Ian are still recovering from that 12% savage beer oh, yeah, that, that Jeff Hollingworth laid on us. I can't remember what it was called now. Oh, it's like, it's called like, like dying in a forest I, I, or something. I, I, iron, iron something. Iron no, wood? There, was, there was definitely trees and forests involved. Iron wood, I think. Yeah. Can't remember. They could it's call t- it anything. To me, it just tasted like medicine. Yeah, not, it's like those those Trappist Belgian. So it's good for you. Actually, do you know what? It tasted like bad medicine, which might not be the first John Bon Jovi reference that we make. <laughs> Jeff's going to be really upset if he watches this because he was. Uh... No, he doesn't. He knows he was trying to medicine us. He knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> he was compensating compensate for the fact he was off the booze. He thought, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to mess these guys up. Yeah. So make them look ridiculous. Yeah. No, and, and fair play. I mean, that's that's a proper that's a proper play you did there. So anyway, we're just getting over that. We're back to the sort of safe haven of uh, Hazy Jane and uh, and what's this one? Uh, what's this one? Planet Pale. Actually, shout out to uh, the in Austin they have this beer called Macana Haze, which tastes just like Hazy Jane. Right. It's Matthew McConaughey's beer. It's, it's yeah. his, yeah. is his, is it? Yeah. All right. It's not just some random. Uh, uh, well, one one barman told them, told us that it had nothing to do with him, and then, right. then we went somewhere where there were photos of him on the wall, which was right. a bit of a giveaway but so what's that bar I, I'm, st- I'm still not sure it's his <laughs> i'm still not sure well they probably be. i He's mean got... they get you get these big names they get involved in all kinds of shit like i think metallica makes a bourbon or something and, mm. and you get some comedian there's some comedian that does a that does a tequila yeah yeah run white right oh yeah. yeah ironically now that he's off the source really <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Yeah, Ron White's this, this comedian who you know, uh, anyone who's a fan of Rogan will know him because he's on there regularly, and he was just a massive alcoholic. Yeah. And then he just suddenly, I think his doctor went, yeah, you're going to die. And he went, all right, I won't fucking get pissed anymore. That's good. Yeah, I th- I'm waiting for that moment. Until then. Way! <laughs> <laughs> right. Just don't go to the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, that's kind of what my tactic is. Uh. Anyway, um, uh, what's going on? Well, before I witter on, we should say that we're delighted to have a special guest this week. I feel a presence in the room. We've got Dario... <laughs> oh, shit, I've forgotten how to pronounce his name. Tal... Talmezio. Talmezio. Tal- I should say, but this is not the first time Dario's been on the pod. The first time you've been in the studio pod, is it? Rather than us just grabbing you at a trade show. Uh, yes, first I, time I, in, this studio, because, in this uh, studio. I thought he'd studio. done... One in the old studio, but, oh, really? but well, we had a discussion about it on Monday, and I was insisting that he'd done more than one, and he was saying not. He's probably okay. right. Well, I can remember. I was a bit one. drunk by that stage, so I can remember yeah. one, but you know, <laughs> my memory isn't what it used to be, especially when I start drinking that nasty beer. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's great to have you in the studio. Thank it's you. It's a bit more. It's a bit more together in the studio. You know, we're in a more comfortable environment. We can have a few beers, yeah. chat I'm, for longer. I'm on, the only reason I'm here is because I've heard you can drink lunchtime in your studio. So there we go. Okay. There we go. I did bunk with some colleagues, so I won't uh, grass up. But in the lift, they'd, they'd already been having a massive lunch. It's after two. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's and Friday. It's, nice it's Friday. It's sunny. We nearly always talk about the weather. It's a really nice sunny day. Yeah. Um, and it's almost a Queen's Jubilee. Almost a Queen's Jubilee. Oh, yeah. And that's the only reason I'm going to go out on the lash is to toast her madge. <laughs> 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 Uh, I think it's, it's, what she, it's what she would expect of her subjects. <laughs> um, so uh, I hope she makes it until next. I mean, she's been queen course, yeah. for about four hundred years. I think she, she can't be in any doubt it. as to what our national <laughs> tendencies are. Um, so uh, so yeah, lovely day. And I'm toasted by leaving this country <laughs> to the queen, to the queen, <laughs> and the other queen, and all the queens. Oh, and the other queen. Yeah, we yeah. just. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna name them because I've just got the email in. But someone. Just sent an email just as I just before we started filming, going, um, "We've got a box at the O2 for Queen. Do you fancy it?" And I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> I've never seen Queen live. I'm really jealous of those people who went and saw them at things like Live Aid and, and when they had the kind of magic." Well, I wish I'd seen them when, when obviously the man was obviously around, with Freddie. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but do you know what? I'll settle for this. Yeah. I even went and saw Guns N' Roses when it's just Axel and then some randoms, including a bloke who had a KFC bucket on his head. Oh yeah, <laughs> I remember that guy. 
yeah. yeah. Bucket. Uh, he called himself Buckethead. Buckethead, yeah. That was his. That was his USP. I wasn't was being quite handy at the guitar. Yeah, yeah. And he just had a KFC, like presumably not one that. Had but he recently could he had see what he was doing. He was just wandering around the stage, not looking. Maybe at that anything. was his thing. He was going, "I'm so good at the guitar. I don't even need to be able he to see it." He had to feel it. He had to feel it. Yeah. 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 I know. He I know used that, the force. I'm just thinking more about him falling over like into the crowd. Paint as well on his face, like. Yeah, I don't even know who he is. Anyway, my point is, I went and saw GNR when it was just Axel. I'm quite happy to see um, Queen when they got Half of Queen. two of their core people, obviously not Freddie and, and John Deacon, less so. He, he didn't exactly jump about the place at the best of times. But Apparently, he did just write now some a recluse. Lines. He did write, he did sort of write uh, another one, Bites of Dust. Although Nile Rogers might beg to differ. Well, it's probably the bass player, not even Nile Rogers. That's a good point. I don't know who the bass player is. <laughs> anyway, we digress. Um, so delighted to have you here. Sorry, this Thank is kind you. of normal chaotic bullshit you have to deal with at the start. Yeah. Delighted to have you here. And, and just to uh, position you, you are a principal analyst at Omdia. Yeah, I'm research director. Research for, director, sorry. For service provider strategy right. at Omdia. Yeah. And, and what, what, what do service provider strategies mean? That seems a bit nebulous. Does that just mean operators? It, it's not. I mean, if oh. you look at uh, if you look at the service provider business, it's as nebulous as uh, as the service provider business is. So it's, right. uh, it's quite nebulous then. No, it okay. is. <laughs> I was just being a dick. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. I mean, on both uh, statements. It <laughs> <laughs> just just completely messing with Dario's head from the start. <laughs> it, you're right in, in the sense that we try and understand what the business model or the operating model or the future of service service providers is, and it's um, it is nebulous. Yeah, in many There's ways. Yeah. Well, no. The only thing that I think it's is cloudy. Nebulous, Cloud who are oh, yes, increasingly cool, cool. so. No, the only my, my, mine's a more a semantical thing. I know our whole our whole bit of the business that telecoms.com is in, light readings in, Omdi is in, or at least your bit of Omdi is service provider. It's just a semantical <coughs> thing. Service provider technically could mean anything. Anyone yeah, who provides yeah. a service, it could be someone who works at McDonald's. But we we use it to mean <laughs> what I call operators. So service provider yeah. under the te- in the telecom sector, Scott. Yeah. Yeah, I know you're off right. Okay, but about. there's still other services you can provide in the telecoms yeah. context, isn't there? Like cloud services, you're just alluding to. Well, they're trying to do that, aren't they? So anyway, I, I admit yeah, I'm no, being. No, but it, you have a point in that. It, traditionally, when we talk about service providers, we mean telecom service providers. Yeah. So because we're lazy, we drop telecom. Oh, yeah. but that's I think what operator's we mean. not very good either, actually, is it though? What does operator mean? I mean, just means you. Used to mean like back. I, like, I'm a bit of an operator. Machine you know? operator. <laughs> Smooth <laughs> operator. <laughs> Do you know what? If if anyone has got well, that Sade song as their whole music and their operator, I fucking raise my glass to them. That carrier is the one that the US people use, isn't it? They use carrier to yes. mean carrier. companies that have. But I again, that yeah, so much, what are you, but... carrier pigeon? <laughs> this it's a semantical line minefield. What we do for a living, basically. telco. Telco, but that can mean but sort of is vendors it and stuff. Telco, sometimes. I mean, yeah. It, to your point, it's no longer just telco either. So. Anybody's so, um, a service provider. They are not just telco. So we're talking about the internet. So, um, <laughs> I think you, you, we need to narrow it down. Yes, I think so. So, um, so yeah. w- welcome to Telecoms.com podcast. We're going to spend an hour and a half discussing the semantics of telecoms. <laughs> yeah, um, well, it's been a quiet news week. <laughs> yes, we might as well. Sort of clinging to just news adding. life rafts as we do. I always <laughs> insist that us hacks earn our living when it's quiet. Mm. I feel like I've been earning my living all year. I mean, that much going on, is there? Um, I mean, we still manage to churn out five yeah. or six stories a day, but yeah. God, it feels like getting blood out of a stone sometimes. Do more stuff, industry, please. Um, and within service providers slash operators slash carriers slash telcos, are you more focused on the mobile or fixed line or just the full Monty? Uh, traditionally, more on the mobile side. Okay, well, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So am I. So uh, that, that, that's a stroke of luck. Cool. So anyway, <laughs> so uh, that's that. So welcome. Um, I might as well get Thank into you. what we're going to chat about then. Um, we are going to. So we're going to start by talking about that. We probably we haven't predetermined it. As, as I've said many times, we don't really give this too much thought. Dara's probably appalled as an analyst. He's used to being a bit more organised <coughs> than this. Uh, he's probably appalled at the utter randomness, it, amateur chaos of it all. But you know that's part of the charm, isn't it? It is, yeah. That's what I'm counting on, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only string I've got to my bow. Um, and I imagine, so we'll talk about mobile, which will probably mean 5G, but I think we're going to talk also, you know, one, one of your many strengths is talking about the sort of environment in which um, telecoms exists. 
uh, it's not commercially regulatory, <coughs> that sort of thing. So I'm sure we're going to talk about that stuff. Whether that yeah. gives you much help for your captions, Pierre, we'll, we'll see you on Monday morning, eh? Um, and then other things that we've been up to this week. Well, actually, we might, might have to explain. I'll hand a ball over to you, Ian. You are wearing what I called a whistle, and you didn't know that Cockney rhyming saying, whistle and flute means suit. So we're used to you wearing one of your three T-shirts, but... Uh, <laughs> But now you're actually wearing a suit. Looking dapper. Huh? You've got a new one. I've never seen that one before. Yeah. It's because it hasn't got such a Larry logo. It's Desert Fest. It is a, um, a sort of metal slash hard rock festival that just takes place all over Camden Town. Right. It's the main bits in the roundhouse, but they've got it in little pubs. Yeah. And you just sort of mill up and down sort of um, Chalk Farm Road. Um, I know the roundhouse, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was all good. For, but mainly bands you haven't heard of. Yeah. Like more obscure, like pub bands. But yeah. it's good. Um, so why are you looking even um, more I, dapper than usual? I had a meeting with Nokia. Ah. So, uh, and Tommy Owito. Right. You're supposed to do your little Oh, yeah, thing, my do. Your little so I, for some reason, as soon as you said that before, I just went, Tommy used to work on the docks. <laughs> and I was wondering whether the union's been on strike and whether Tommy's down on his luck, because we know it's tough. He's pretty yeah. perky, actually. Good. So, well, then um, then he's not adhering to the lyrics of no. Living on a Prayer, which is probably um, just as well. So he's he's head of mobile, so he's... Like they've got four or five business units, I think. He's um, one of the main, one of the main dudes. Um, in Mobile's the biggest one. Yeah, uh, I think about forty-five percent of revenue. So, uh, despite the obviously, I could tell Lucent with all of its fixed and IP and core stuff is a big part of the business now. But Mobile's still the biggest bit, and yeah, he's in charge of all that. So, cool. Um, and, you, and you can chat about. Um, yeah, I can. T- it was all on the record. It was all on the record. All on the record. So we had so, one yeah. other one. We had. That's your second meeting with Nokia this week. Yeah. Because we did also meet Sil- Phil Silverter? Silverter? Yeah. Uh, Silverter. Now that you've said it, I don't know. I, I knew before I came in. He's the head of UK, yeah? Yes. CEO yeah. of the UK business. So we had lunch yeah. with him, but that was all just us I chatting. Si- I think it's Silverter. Silverter. Yes. So that was all just us chatting, so we're not going to talk about anything we chatted about. But he obviously just told us so much goss. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but The things they're doing. The things they're up to. Um, but yes, so I think we'll finish off hearing about your chat with uh, yeah, okay. Tommy, who has never and continues to not work on the dock. Well, he might have done. Who knows? That's true. Did you ask him? I, I should have been my opening question. Tommy, did you ever used to work on the dock? <laughs> you call yourself a journalist. <laughs> I don't think the Bon Jovi Tommy ended in I, which your, your name has to end in I if you're finished. That's the rules, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they do have a lot of I. Talking about, you said, you said that you weren't aware of any Finnish bands. I've got mm. to tell you that I found one and it's called Battle Beast <laughs> and it's headed up by this this um, female singer she's got an amazing voice but she looks like a Valkyrie she like wears this sort of costume armour yep. and she's you know and she just looks like she'd kick your ass wasn't there a, a Finnish band death metal band that won the Eurovision like 10 years ago that's right and they were dressed up like Slipknot or something yeah like, like monsters yeah yeah <laughs> so there we are. They've got quite a good metal scene over in Finland. Yeah. You can imagine, you know, all those cliches about for half the year it's dark and so they all just get off their tits. Yeah. I imagine they listen to a lot of metal. I should, I should have asked him that as well. Mm. But Sorry, Finland, for generalising about that. I wonder if Wade... Should I have asked him about saunas as well? About saunas. Yeah. Saunas and, and homebrew, homebrew, <laughs> homebrew savage, <laughs> like moonshine. Those are the cliches. Those are all my Finnish yeah. cliches. That and about to join the... NATO, but that's slightly yeah. bit, bit more bit more current affairs that one. Quite surprised mm. to learn about your knowledge of Eurovision. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. <laughs> hey man, when I was a kid, Bucks Fizz won it. Uh, <laughs> that was the last time <laughs> they had me at Bucks Fizz. That was the last time the UK won, wasn't it? We came second this year. Wasn't there Walking on Sunshine? Wasn't that that band? This weren't year, they, weren't they in? Um, so. No, this is still like decades. Th- this ago. year we came second. Yeah, some beard. But if bloke. it hadn't been for the war in Ukraine, we'd probably have won it. Yeah, because yeah. they did some. They did. <laughs> that's true. They did some new this year. I mean, I never really watch it. I've, I find it the most sort of trite, tedious thing. There was some sort of merit in it when when Terry Wogan used to narrate it because he used to have this funny, really dry, yeah. piss taking tone. Because mm. it's such a silly event and it's all. Oh, it's not a silly. No, event. I think it's, the, it's, no. Any, it's only the Brits. Are you quite into it? Are you? It's only the Brits who uh, think it's silly. Uh, okay, because we never win. It is silly, <laughs> but it historically had a, an important meaning, which was after the war, let's unite people through music. Has it been going that long? Oh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Fucking hell. Will the, Ferrell did a parody movie about it on Netflix. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. That's quite... Actually, speaking of Will Ferrell, I'll transition here. Uh, I didn't plan this, but the city of the month is uh, oh, yeah. Wales Vagina, also known oh, yeah. as San Diego. <laughs> what? what why, why did... 
It's from Anchorman. Rude words coming to... Oh, I see. He what? calls it... What does San Diego mean? He's like, I think it means Wales, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> That's him not asking up the Spanish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see, right. I think it means San Diego. And he goes, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Anyway, okay, and that's our city of the month. Yeah, and the second uh, cl- very close city is uh, Kuala Lumpur. Which means dolphins knob. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, it actually does. <laughs> actually, I would like to know what Kuala Lumpur is. <laughs> anyway, this is very rude. Oh, dear. I hope, I hope no one who can sack us is... You're going to cut this, right? No, we don't. <laughs> I mean, some people like the rude, the, the childish <laughs> bullshit. Oh, wait, Kuala Lumpur means muddy confluence. Oh, it's close then. Uh-huh. Muddy confluence. In Malay. <laughs> Sounds like an upmarket blues singer. <laughs> yeah, muddy confluence. <laughs> <laughs> I like to listen to a bit of muddy confluence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, have we, have we finished talking shit? I think we have. It's only been 60 minutes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, cool. All right. Then we will get into it. Um, Just so remind you. You what? The reminder. What? Rem- oh, yes, of course. Sorry. You've reminded me about the reminder. Um, before we get into it, I shall remind you that if you're watching us on the site or on YouTube or on Facebook, you can also listen to it on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and loads of other podcasting platforms. I'm actually s- wondering whether or not I should ditch Spotify. Why? Because I just keep shaking myself about the cost of living and how expensive everything is. I'm already thinking of getting rid of Netflix. Oh, but uh, podcasts are free on Spotify. With ads? No. Oh, well, ads. Yeah, yeah. So I signed up for Spotify so I could listen to Rogan. I thought I had to... I, I, I don't have a premium and I, there's no ads. Oh, my God. Well, I'm definitely <laughs> How does he make money, then? How do they make money from him? It must be ad-funded in some way. Uh, there's no ads when I listen to it. But and there I don't are normally ads it. within the No, talk. there's never ads when I play it. It's mm. weird. Well, Maybe not Rogan, but most of the okay. others have... He's got bottles plug. on the table yeah. with something written on it, no? Oh, no, he, I mean, he's got plenty of money f- from this, that and the other. It's just specifically, I, I signed up for Spotify when he switched from YouTube to... Spotify. Yeah, me too, but then I cancel my premium and then it's it still plays with the When did you cancel it? Like in January. Okay, so it's like you got some hangover of your subscription. All right, I might give it a go because that's like a tenner a month. Yeah. 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 Netflix, tenner or so a month. Suddenly I cut these things out and I've got enough to. Get two beers. A one and a half. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's like. A beer and a half in central London. (laughs) A month. Oh, like a whole catalogue of footage. No, two beers. (laughs) Yes. I know. Puts it into perspective, doesn't it? That's when uh, Noel Gallagher was complaining. These youth, like, didn't want to buy an album. It's like two pints. Mm. But an album is forever. Yeah. No, good point. Whereas, for some reason, we don't apply the same value judgment to pints. There's something about it. We're like, we're sitting there. I don't care what it forever. costs. <laughs> yeah, I'm with my mates and it's a Friday. I'm going to spend 50 quid. <laughs> right. Um, Dario. Sorry for so much bullshit before we got to you. Um, so, we haven't necessarily... So, Dario's a colleague. Um, we should stress that Omdia is owned by Informer, as is Light Reading, as is Telecoms.com. So, we're all kind of colleagues. We're all 15th owned floor. by the same people. One we're owned. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're all... Someone, we're all the same person's bitch. Oh, sure. um, and uh, but that's good because <laughs> it means that we all know each other. Um, in fact, we just popped out um, with you on Monday, didn't we? We went and hung out. Um, that was we good we fun. Did, yeah. So um, yeah, and we just thought, let's get him on. It's been a while, um, and I guess the place to start is to sort of not put you on the spot too much, but sort of tap some of your um, knowledge, research, awareness, whatever about the current state of play of telecoms. And let's focus <coughs> primarily on the mobile side. Mm-hmm. So focus primarily on the on the five G side. I don't know if you have sort of geographical constraints to your expertise or whether you've just got the whole world sorted. But if you don't mind me yeah, putting you on the spot, you know, we're, here we are. We're halfway through twenty twenty two. We we started banging on about five G about sort of five six seven years ago. It started appearing in its nascent forms uh, towards in 2019, 2020. Mm-hmm. How are things looking at the moment? Is it going according to plan? Um, yes and no. <laughs> I don't, I'm, I apologize for not having a straight answer. But when you it's start, quite right? We like nuance yeah. on the Comes <coughs> podcast. Yeah, it hurt. Um, <laughs> but when you start, it said, "What's the state of play in the telecom business?" It's it's actually not too bad if you think that we, as as a telecom business, you know, the the overall telecom pot last year grew by about. Five percent. Um, it's quite exceptional, and it hasn't happened for uh, many, many, many. Okay. I didn't years. know that. Yeah, that's 
Uh, and that's, of course, you know, when you compare contrast to the growth rates of uh, the, let's say, hyperscale business or the software business, it's, it's obviously not as good. Um, but it's 2021 was a very positive year and this year it looks like it's carrying on the, on this uh, trajectory. That's now you, you kind of you mix in this with not mixing, but you're, you're throwing it the, the, the 5G topic into it. Is it thanks to 5G? It's, it's probably not because 5G is not as big yet to have an, an impact on the markets or on the global market. But when you look at um, those markets or some of those markets where 5G has a very good penetration, like Korea and China, then you can see that there is a bit of an ARPU up, uplift uh, in there. So That's always a big question mark about 5G is that the ARPU uplift and, and the actual ROI. You sort of accept that we quite often on this podcast don't know how often you hear it, but we quite often um, just question the this decade cycle of the G's mm. uh, that we did we did on Monday as well, didn't we? Well, I think I think the telcos question it as well increasingly now. Right. Okay. Um, it suits it suits parts of the industry, yeah. doesn't it? Who are flogging suits commercial might not see marketing the guys having parts. to spend money on licenses and yeah. new equipment all the and, time. And I mean, as I think it, I said on Monday, I, th- I thought four G as a as a consumer justified itself because it was it was proper mobile broadband but you know I, I'm still not convinced re- that 5G sort of was justifying the yeah but the I don't, I'm not sure 4G did justify itself on that basis you mean in terms of like ARPU and that sort of thing yeah I mean it, because when 4G came along it wasn't uh, it wasn't <coughs> like the market wasn't fairly saturated already right you know people had already that whole mobile revolution happened actually late 90s early 2000s you know by the time yeah, 4G came point. along in what 2010 2011 let's say yeah. I think first networks people had phones it wasn't I mean this was the argument I was working at a consulting company during the sort of 3G rollout and going around doing um, sort of bid book you know applications for companies bidding for licenses and they were building these I won't say who it was because then it'd be sort of embarrassing for them but they were doing these um, why were they shit um, no 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 it's, it's more it's, everybody was doing the same thing but the but the bond models that were built to sort of justify spending god knows what on a license and the, re- the amounts were ridiculous yeah what they were coughing up for, for spectrum yeah. licenses. The 3G justi- was yeah, 3G. The, it? Yeah. the justification for that was that people would um, spe- they would sort of the people who already had phones and were using voice and basic text on that would spend more. They would double ARPU. Yeah. A lot of it, a lot of it was based on a sort of idea that you would double ARPU, yeah. Indeed. And clearly it's like almost selling phones again to all these people. It's like having another second mobile boom. And it never, never it happened. never happened. And then when 4G came along I mean, Derek, obviously, RP uplift's good, and if it's more efficient and they've got some cost savings from it, that's good as well. But I, I kind of feel 4G was good for us, maybe, as consumers. Yeah, so that's what I should clarify. That, that was I'm the point sure I was, was making. I completely concede your point about ARPU and the business case. But as a consumer, it was the first time I could see a new generation of technology dramatically altered my experience as a consumer. Yeah, uh, I was getting proper mobile absolutely. broadband. I don't know. I I still remember vividly the first time I uploaded a picture with my 4G phone compared to my 3G. Was, ah, yeah, straight away. Was that quick? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that that's that moment of surprise, excitement. Well, if you can get excited by the upload speed, um, we do. It's our yeah, job to get no, excited. No, I do. About that I stuff. do. But like, I don't know how many. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think but it's something that was, was it was noticeable. At, yeah. Looking at video as well on 4G. Yeah. I mean, you can do that now on a 4G network. On a, if you want to do it, I don't do it very often. But if you're sitting on a train or and you've got a good connection on the train, yeah. or on a bus or something, or you're just sitting on a park bench somewhere, yeah. you can actually watch a. You're not like that um, MP um, who was watching Grot in the Commons then. No, I did that in private. Mm. He was on Wi Fi, probably, not <laughs> even. Wi- <laughs> Commons Wi Fi with no, with no filth firewall. Um, so, anyway, sorry. I thought we, he was looking for. Uh, he was looking for track 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 And there's one called cool. a Dominator. <laughs> <laughs> and then he suddenly ends up with Madame Whiplash. And he's like, oh, oh, okay, well, while, I, while I'm here, shame to, shame to waste the data, he seemed to think. Um, okay, sorry, so we, we interrupted you. So you were just... You were just you were just sort of setting up the, you know, where we are. Uh, in terms yeah. Of okay. Uh, can't remember. So, okay. So y- yes, we are. We do see a little bit of an uplift, but it's different. So you mentioned 
that 4G to 3 to 4G kind of jump was incredible. Consumers got really excited, started buying phones. Um, but also, if you remember back in 2010 and 12, ARPU started declining. So yes, consumers <laughs> loved it, but had a, the opposite effect for service providers. 5G is different it's in, in terms of and then nobody's really expecting to find the killer application. Right. Yeah. But and and every single service pro service provider out there is very aware of the fact that monetizing at least the consumer side of 5G requires a bit of uh, an old school type of monetization but also a little bit of a new school type of monetization. So with the old school I'm talking about the classic more for more. So if you look at what all service providers or the majority of service providers are doing in 5G they they try and migrate people to unlimited tariff plans with 5G and with it moving from a metered or, or a, a capped let's say even with a large bundle into a un unlimited they they ask for an extra little bit <clears throat> this is why we're talking about one or two extra percentage points right. of our point increase and that's uh, versus and them having to provide quite a lot more service well technically uh, i guess it depends how much people who are on, on unlimited actually use it it, yes, it depends on uh, on how much of it is is uh, effectively used, but it's uh, but it's not just just that. It's the whole kind of move to unlimited. On top of that, maybe having access to better speed. So look at Verizon the way they do it. You get access to on the higher tariff plans. You go unlimited, but you also have access to the wideband, so called, so the millimeter wave. If you are on a cheap tariff, you only get access to the nation five nationwide oh, I don't know, I don't know that either. <clears throat> do they do they make that clear like yes, if you if you pay a bit yeah. more they say you get million cuz I'd be curious to know how they sell millimeter wave to someone who doesn't have to know about that shit like we do for a living no you, you don't sell millimeter wave you sell a better tariff plan. right you sell a tariff plan a that better, is unlimited also has a little bit of content and you also market it as better connectivity that allows you to you, you market as um Actually, they use wideband on the marketing material, but that's yeah. Uh, yeah, which is okay. a bit yeah, yeah. kind of slightly unusual. But it's a combination. This is what, what we normally call it: is the entire proposition that is redesigned. It's not just this is yeah. 4G, that's the price. This is 5G, that's the price. But, but it, when you're saying that nobody expects there to be a killer application, I mean, I you know, I know, know what I you mean, mean by it. that. But I guess you know, if you talk to the people who develop the technology on the vendor side and you know they're looking out now to things like 6g but we've still got a long way to go with 5g and we've got 5g advanced it's actually one of the things mm. i was chatting to nokia about earlier. is that officially a thing 5g advanced now yeah like LTE. Yeah, it is it's later yeah. releases basically before yeah. it becomes 6g but a lot of the stuff that they're talking about there is is you know things like um what is it oh, i can't even remember it so i mentioned but it's basically increasing the uplink capability and yeah. um, okay. and then you could do um potentially new applications but i think when the problems with some of this stuff is that it's not the operators that benefit anyway is it it's not the back in the days of 3g they were again going back to my sort of earlier role they were thinking that they'd be the companies that developed these applications and were able to monetize them and it hasn't been them it's been it's been the internet companies that do you have think done we're it, not going to so. do the decimal point bullshit this time like 5.5. Oh, 5 no, I'm sure that'll happen. Oh. Yeah, I mean, Why some not? some that's some, that's some companies me. are already calling the, the, the what will be 5G advanced 5.5G, oh, okay. which is very proprietary known better. to one company, um, to call it 5.5G, I would say. That sounds yeah. like an American thing to do to me. Mm, the other side. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> other side, <laughs> Japan. Pierre's <laughs> going three with his Huawei. fingers. Isn't it? Anyway, whatever. They're doing it. Whatever. If, yeah. if if Terry wanted to name them, he would have. Um, yeah, I know. I just that just that just annoys me. I mean, it's, again, it's a sort of pedantic thing, a bit like me banging on about service but provider. But I just think it's not very really useful. I would say though that let's not forget that five G was designed for enterprises and industrial cases. The, the fact that yeah. it's been launched for consumer is almost accidentally being launched for consumers because it's available and the devices and of course it would be much better for consumers for certain applications would be much better so uh, sorry to button from you as, as an analyst because it, it should be stressed to people who don't know analysts and i, and I know actually both me and i know this because we have been analysts in the past you just get a different 
level of briefing and access and interaction with companies in the in your space than you do as a journalist. There's certain privilege access that us journalists get, and obviously we also have the privilege of, I suppose, you know, we're, we're not we don't position ourselves as experts, so we yeah, can afford going to, to talk good shit. concert, uh, right. and we get to go, to, <laughs> go and see Queen um, and all that sort of thing. But I'm but whereas analysts will get a more companies will talk to analysts in a certain way because they're confident that that stuff isn't going to find its way into the public domain straight away whereas that the, the deal is supposed to be a journalist unless it's very explicitly off the record that we can write up anything that happens in a conversation so i'm curious to know from briefings you had over the years from vendors operators whatever it was was it always understood that 5g was was overwhelmingly a, 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 like something that, that just helps the industry it helps operators uh, or that is a b2b proposition rather than a consumer proposition I think it was fairly clear from the outset that it was okay. meant to be enterprise related and industry related. But the fact that it's been marketed so heavily to cons well, uh, some countries it's been marketed quite heavily to consumers and there's been you know a lot of attention on rollout even here, you know, and and it's almost like they've the enterprise stuff hasn't really happened as fast as they were thinking, I'm guessing. You know, it's been a it's been a lot slower to take shape and and even now it's all it, to me I find it really hard to get a handle on enterprise 5G. I mean, I know it's considered to be the exciting side of it and it could make a huge difference to factory automation and all this stuff, but there just seems to be so much going on, so many different iterations, so many different companies in the mix. No one really knows who's going to win that. I mean, even now, there are even now speculation the operators might not play that big a role in it, the traditional operators, you know. Well, um, I think there are many things happened as well as the development of the 5G standard, uh, which maybe arguably wasn't developed with necessarily with service provider and EMBB in mind. EMBB is one of the use cases. So for enhanced mobile broadband. Yes, yes, kind of the smartphone business. Yeah. Basically, <coughs> fatter pipe, more yeah. bandwidth. Yeah, it's kind of clever pipe. But then, oh, okay. the, then things happened in or developed in, in in the meantime, which is net neutrality, which is instead of getting relaxed, is getting even more stringent even uh, this is a uh, recent we can, we can get into that actually yes. this we is like a China very Island. very recent development so uh, the barrack uh, sorry the um, european court of justice made a final decision only a couple of months ago that uh, zero rating cannot happen a month later the um, uh, bundesnet uh, agentur the german regulator uh, already banned already quite quickly um, uh, Vodafone Pass, uh, as well as uh, Streamon, which were two of the m very big tariff plans of Vod uh, Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom, where uh, essentially they were zero rating some traffic that was some, some of the traffic that was coming from partners. So the whole idea of creating this. I, I don't want to call it two-sided business model, but let's, let's just call it for simplicity two-sided business model. It's getting wrecked essentially by the net neutrality regulation, right. and that, and then it's, you know, and then you transpose all of this to network slicing, which is another mm. business opportunity that it, it was, a, it is still a big promise of 5G. Um, How does that? How does well, that it's affected. reconcile itself with net neutrality. You know, it does. We were all in yeah. that um, briefing with Vodafone where we chatted about that, didn't we? That oh, yes, we up. did. Yeah, yeah. That, that came up during the briefing. Well, yeah. I think this is all like the. I think the European. It might just not just be the European Union. Other, other authorities are as well are in a sort of total. You know, they don't really. They haven't really got their sort of logic sorted out on this issue at all. I don't think. I mean, at the same time as doing what you've you've just said and and telling. The companies they can't do these stream on plans or whatever they're now talking about um having internet companies contribute to the costs of building networks which is the same kind of thing the net neutrality was always about not taking payment from you know not charging not discriminating against traffic or requiring um, a payment from the internet provider and the, and the operators have been running around for ages saying we need them to pay for mm. some of those traffic costs. So there's a contradiction there. And, and, and the European Union all of a sudden seems to be more receptive to that argument. And yet at the same time, it doesn't allow, you know, it's restrictive yeah. on things like stream. It, there, there, there's a real inconsistency. They haven't really I got I don't think it's inconsistent in, in the sense that if, if from their perspective, it's about protecting consumers at all costs. Yeah, and we go back into the old costs, but uh, 
so preventing um, preventing service providers from doing an effective segmentation or commercially based segmentation of the traffic uh, has kind of the same effect as as kind of imposing price caps or or like just anything that can keep the the pressure on the retail prices um, I don't think that the net neutrality was uh, sorry the, uh, the, that slicing is necessarily designed for for uh, let's say internet companies to pay for for the network deployment it may be, yes maybe for some it certainly gives them the, the the tools to do it if they it, it to. does give the tools to do it um, but not the deployment as such it would give them it would give some different characteristic of networks <clears throat> for which they would need to pay a premium eventually mm. but i mean it's all theoretical at this point because obviously we 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 cannot do well, it's, much it's interesting we got, we got we've got two topics there which i i think we'll, we'll get we'll get into the um operators in europe asking for us big tech to chip in for the cost of networks in a bit because i know you've i've chatted to you about that before i know you've got thoughts on it and it's an interesting topic and it's quite topical it has come up a few times in recent weeks and months mm -hmm. where you've got organizations like etno and, and other sort of pan-european sort of mobile industry lobbying organizations having a bit of a moan um but the net neutrality one just to do that i mean this has come up before but to me there, there are two distinct subsets of net neutrality that get discussed. There's the one where you can, um, I suppose, bias or prejudice or, 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 or optimise the pipe for certain people. And that's the one that comes up more in the States, I think, when they're talking about net neutrality. You know, is it fair for um, either, either the, the consumer... I mean, everyone accepts the consumer can pay for a superior service, OK? For example, with an ISP, this is, so this is fixed line, but it applies to mobile as well. You can pay more and get a better service. Everyone accepts that. No one's got a problem with that. That's not a net, net neutrality issue, is it? No. So well, then, to another network, isn't it? Or yeah, or the same network. one. I mean, you can go with you know you can go with BT and you can get there. Yeah. Hundred megabits per second, or five hundred, or one gig, or whatever. You know, that's just that's just providing better service, more money. I mean, if you rule that out, then what's the fucking point? Yeah. Um, but and then there's the one where people at the other end, I. Um, you know, at, at the business end, can can effectively pay operators to give them some kind of preferential. So typically, um, people think about subscription video on demand players like Netflix yeah. or whatever, mm. paying to have a have a better service for their videos than someone else gets. And that that tends to be the more, if I've understood it correctly, that tends to be the more pure net neutrality thing. But then I find this zero rating thing interesting because I think that's different. That's commercial. No one's arguing with zero rating. You necessarily get a better service. They're yeah, just saying you don't have to pay for the, it. The trouble with this stuff is because it's quite nebulous. And who decides what net neutrality means? Even? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole issue of internet companies paying for networks is gets framed as part of the net neutrality discussion. Yeah. And yet that's not necessarily... If that happened without them saying, well, you get a preferential service for you doing it, then to some people maybe it's not a net neutrality issue. But as soon as you start to say... Um, you know, you can't discriminate between different forms of internet traffic, or you can't favour certain companies over other others. What's the difference between zero rating and even just some marketing tie-up between Netflix and Vodafone, where they do some advertising thing and promote Netflix yeah. a bit more? You know, you could still say it's 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 helping that company it's over its rivals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's some kind of bias that favours it on the network. You know, and it, 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 it is, it, but it's, it's not, very very yeah. nebulous. The whole thing. I it think. is nebulous, but it's not necessarily intervening on the traffic itself. But but because, the sort of yeah. stream on stuff's getting towards the very far end of it. I think the the the, the stuff that they've weighed in on recently and said, oh, you've got this tie up with. So, which is which is zero rating. You know, you've got this tie up with. Now the so issue, so I guess, with zero rating. Well, no, I guess the issue with zero rating is the fact that uh, if a company has a privilege of being zero rated, maybe there is a commercial privilege, or maybe this is not, and then it depends. Um, then all the others are in a position of disadvantage. So even if it's not discrimination on the traffic, you still get discrimination on the player, which is a breach of neutrality um, in certain ways. But, um, what do you think of that as a concept? Because I'm, I'm not buying it. What do you think, though? It, it, I think it's a bit, it's a bit bigger, uh, as in. Um, 
at some point we need more money into the system uh, of running and deploying good telecom networks. Okay. So we either allow some better ways of, of charging retail customers, such as consumer, or we allow uh, to charge partners, such as <clears throat> kind of two-sided type of business model, including slicing, or we get someone to contribute directly into paying for the networks, or we get state funding, or, right. or yeah. we, we do something about it because in some markets, clearly networks are not developed to the standard we need to have. I, I like your okay. position on it because the trouble with it is that there's not nuance in yeah. all of the discussions. It's like the US position. that You get people walking around with placards like save the internet <laughs> and, and the legislation Bless just seems them. to swing backwards and forwards between the Democrats and the Republicans. And it's, it's either one thing or the other. And to me... This idea that internet companies should be forced to stump up network costs, I find that a bit ridiculous, frankly. You know, maybe by then but, they will own the network, so they will well, definitely pay the for thing, it. this is the other thing. If they're <laughs> going to be forced to fund the networks, then they take a share in it, surely. Yeah. But well, if you just say you have to fund it, but you don't have any stake, that's just an extra tax, isn't it's it? Like it's a windfall tax like we've just done on It's that like ridiculous thing that Netflix has been subjected to in Switzerland or something, where they're having to contribute to the local filmmaking industry. Um, to, to be right. able to operate in... in They've got to make, like, one in I ten mean, films got to be Swedish. You know, I Finnish think that the interesting thing is to look at the way they, they did it in, in, in Korea, or they're doing it in Korea, where essentially the users of the network need to participate in maintaining the quality of service of the network. The, which is a slightly, it's a subtle way of... But they of, could say the same thing about yeah. their data centres or, 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 or some other thing that they're... I mean, it, you know, it's they, they spend a huge amount on infrastructure as well. So they could make the same argument. You know, we're spending money on data centres. Yeah, you can contribute to those costs. I think this is an... That there's a structural problem with the telecom industry and there's a business model problem with the telecom industry, which is that you provide gazillions of, of megabytes or gigabytes to users and they play a flat rate and network costs are going up and they're not making any more money from it. And therefore the response to that is, where can we get some money from? Let's go to the internet companies. And, and actually nobody would use those networks in the first place if it wasn't for the internet companies anyway. They're actually doing the network operators a yeah. favour. Yeah. So I just the whole idea of them... It's, it's almost like retailers saying, oh, look, these... I mean, this is actually the filmmaking thing. It's exactly the same thing. It's, re, you know, retailers going, oh, we can't compete anymore because Amazon and so-and-so have come along and they've completely destroyed the business model. They should be able to... They should contribute something. Otherwise, we can't keep shops open. Mm. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's looking to them and sort of... I agree there's a problem with big tech being all-powerful, and we talk about this on the podcast all the time, and having these three big firms that, you know, have... have you know, all controlling in numerous sectors, actually, not just Certainly telco. It's not, economy, a, yeah. not a healthy thing. But I don't know if this forcing them to do things is necessarily the answer. I think well, some of these other sectors need to be more innovative. Well, that's, and, that's the really tricky bit, isn't it? Um, because it's been decided that comms networks are, are, are sort of national strategic thing, um, which they weren't necessarily always. I mean, yeah, I suppose being able to make phone calls was considered a, a sort of an inalienable right from whenever we all had those we all had phones pre second world war i presume um, but but now it just seems that every new sort of generation is considered some kind of some kind of you know especially you know I mean, trump banged on about this a hell of a lot he really raised the stakes when he's talking about 5g do you remember he even he was he banged on about 7g one time he was just pulling numbers out of his ass at one stage um, but you know the point he's making in his in his sort of idiosyncratic Trumpy way was that this is really important, and of course he framed all his shtick was framed in a very national competitive way. You know, he, he was, his 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 mantra was make America great again, and it was us versus China, us versus whoever. Um, and so, and we, you know, perhaps less so. You know, we've got a. We've got people who, have, who were born in Italy and France in this room, but speaking only from a UK point of view, we, yeah, he was born in France. You, you may have heard us mention it once or twice on the pod. <laughs> and if anyone's wondering where Dario's name and accent come from, it's Italy. Which bit of Italy are you I'm from? I'm from Monza. 
Monza. Where's that near? What, what big city is that Formula One. Formula yeah, I've heard one. that from racing. I know. I'm sorry. It's near Milan. Just okay, so it's that. a northern bit. It's where Ertan Senna died. It's a northern bit, but I, I like to say that I'm half southerner as well. And okay. I'm pride, proud, very proud of both origins. Oh, totally. No, I mean, <laughs> north-south divide. Um, do you have, is that is that just spiritual or do you have some family from yeah, the south family, as well? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they are quite different though. It's a bit of a tangent. I won't, I won't go on about it for long. They are quite different. My very limited experience of Italy, but I absolutely love Italy. Everything about it, the geography, the food, the culture. Um, but this, my most recent this experience. This podcast sponsored by <laughs> Visit Italy. Visit yeah. Italy. <laughs> oh, shit. I wish it, it was. Because then they might send some stuff on, like you know some I mean? nice, nice, nice wine or something. Yeah. We went to uh, Some Campari. About the last major foreign holiday I had, if you don't count visiting my family in the Canaries, was uh, to Sicily. And that was great. And we actually inadvertently got to see a bit of southern Italy because our flights got all fucked up. And instead of flying into Sicily, we ended up having to fly into Brindisi and, and drive all across the foot. Well, that's uh, to get to Sicily. They really got it wrong. Yeah, no, uh, that was, I had to rebook because uh, the flight we were on got cancelled. Anyway, the pilot um, took a wrong turn. Yeah, do you know what I mean? He's like, oh, God, he took a wrong turn at Etna. Took a wrong turn at that cloud. <laughs> I always get that wrong at Etna. Fucking left, not right. Um, but, uh, Tanger, oh, yes. Um, from, from, what, what were we talking about? You were about to say that the, from a the, the internet view. companies aren't properly, I mean, I think they're, not, they're just not, the regulations obviously not. No, that's there. it. I was, no, no, I was talking about American na- culture. National, uh, yeah, it was American culture. Uh, you know, I think, we're probably more wholesale recipients of US culture and politics than maybe Italy and France and, and other parts of Western Europe that, that I know. Um, but, yeah, and, and, and so Trump, Trump was going on about um, networks being this big sort of strategic asset, and that's increasingly how we look at them. And, and obviously that's how they're framing, just to bring, it, bring my weird tangent back to what we were just talking about. That's obviously how it's being framed. It's like, if it's so important to you, then, you know, from, from our ARPU, from our just revenue, from our day-to-day running of our businesses, we're not bringing enough to invest it at the rate. I mean, do you remember, like, Bojo, when he was running, I think, just to be leader of the Tory party, or maybe to be PM, but he had that big thing where he's, he just pulled out some broadband number where by 2025 everyone's got to have one gigabit broadband or something. Yeah, but that, that's the problem, isn't it? That they're heavily, they're subject to heavy regulation. They yeah. can't just go into another and country and start something up. They have to spend huge amounts of money on licenses. They're required to meet universal service obligations. There's all sorts of, you know, their, their prices are regulated on the wholesale side. I mean, all this stuff is, the, the internet players don't have any of this. And it's only recently that people have yeah. been going, hang on a minute. We, and this probably isn't just a telco thing. It's other sectors as well. The, the internet companies, it's yeah. like the Wild yeah. West. They've been sort of left to do their own thing. And it's only now people are going, hang on a minute, this doesn't look healthy for yeah. all sorts of reasons. And I've Freedom got a lot of sympathy speech. for that position. So have I. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. And I, the I, taxation. I mean, it would have been trying to create a, yep. a, a taxation that works internationally. It was but supposed I, to start this I year. Think do it and do properly, then... not do it in a way that's like, oh, contribute to our filmmaking industry because... Yeah. Ad hoc. Yeah, yeah, it, there was an attempt, <laughs> in theory, we were going to have kind of a 15% across the board yeah. from the next year but I mean, it's been put on hold again by the USCD to 2023 I think yeah. no, 15% of what? A, a, a corporate tax rate of 15% at least 15% you know the yeah. classic way of many yeah. companies not paying taxes by licensing the brands to their own subsidiaries totally and the other problem <coughs> right. is that all the big tech happens to be US you know it might not be such Ooh. a problem if Europe had some big tech players but all of them are, well, there's Chinese yeah. ones, but they can't really operate anywhere else no. now. So. But, but all of this is bringing kind of a lot of uh, kind of issues of national identity, sovereignty yeah. and protectionism and uh, anti-competitive practices, if you want, into the telecom business, which is, um, which is not making the life of a global technology, if you think the healthy of technology is is its global nature from a purely probably technology or engineering point of view is that everybody's contributing into it mm. and okay they obviously have their own commercial interest but you know that if you can you contribute to it then you have the, re- the rewards from a scale and and and, and everything but, and i'm wondering we are wondering for how long is that nice situation going to to stay alive, yeah, it's. Uh, 
So, so what what do you think about the the calls for big tech to directly contribute to the cost of networks, which they we can't deny, but the networks are largely, or at least a large proportion of their use is fueled by those big tech companies, whether it's Google, whether it's search or with YouTube or or whatever, or whether it's Amazon with its e-commerce or its own video <coughs> proposition and so on. A few other big guys, Netflix, et cetera, Facebook, social media. What, what are your feelings about those calls for, I suppose, governments and regulators to force US big tech to chip in to the cost of rolling out these networks? Wow, I'm against the war. I am. <laughs> and you're allowed to be nuanced again. We, we have we've got no problem uh, with I, nuance. Uh, it's a really difficult call because it's a, it's legally is a strange requirement. I think um, because if the argument is that oh this company push the content onto the internet they push so much 70 80 90 percent of the traffic they push it nobody's pushing anything on the internet mm. you are a customer yeah. and you call you're pulling it yeah, someone's you're already pulling paid it. for that so, yeah. so i think that you, push pull analogy is a really good one i've heard you, you use it before and i, I really so you know, if i want it. someone to send me something yeah uh, <laughs> and um, maybe I pay for uh, for uh, you know for the privilege of it, or if I want to send something. Sorry, I'm getting into a, a, a even more complicated story here. But um, but fundamentally, that's not how the internet works. They're, they're not sending anything. We are it, me, you, and when mm. you click on Netflix, yeah. you are requesting for. Yeah, it's for, just sitting there on a the server, but, and then yeah. we're asking for but it. I mean. They've arguably created a problem themselves. The regulators who are now sounding sympathetic to this argument have arguably created this problem by being, you know, overly restrictive when it comes to things like MA, for instance. You know, the fact that there's several networks competing in each country, this this there has to be four, which seems to have been some kind of weird magic number that we have to have this four player mobile market. Whereas in the US and China you have three players and you know, they're serving huge, huge um, populations. And, in, and in ARPUs are much, much higher in the US compared with Europe. Mm. You know, it's you can invest more capex. You but know. then you need to think where the premises are of all of this. Much of what the European Well, Union they think they're protecting the consumer. consumer yeah. But they're consumer. not protecting the consumer. If, in the long term, in, they're in the not. Long term, yeah. The reason there's yeah. a problem is because it drives prices down. Then people don't pay enough for what they're getting. Yeah. And we all love it because we can go and get 60 gigabytes per month and only pay 15 pounds. But, you know, you go back to the days of 3G and the way it was priced was so extreme that nobody this is on that one of the early problems with data that they just didn't get the pricing right they were struggling to they yeah. were trying to do it on a metered basis now clearly that didn't work in terms of getting consumers on but to go from that extreme to where we are now where it's unlimited and you pay next to nothing and now they're talking about the networks can't cope there's too much traffic it, you know it, it, to me it's almost a problem that the industry and regulators have sort of created this themselves and you know now they're trying it, to get big tech to in theory, if you think about it, the, the the very the only fair way of doing it is that is to move back into you pay for what you use. Yeah. Both in fixed line yeah. and and mobile, and say so. The more you use, the more you pay. Yeah. You know, there isn't a, a utility out there that yeah. has unlimited usage. The, the other thing is, I, good point. I, I think that the op, God, the we all know that right now be, with the energy prices. Yeah, totally. But I, th I think the operators need to be careful what they wish for. You know, saying we need big tech to come along and pay for networks because they will demand. What will they do? They'll yeah. say, "Well, if we're going to pay for them, we're going to take a stake." Mm. Or they'll say, "Well, we'll build our own network then." You Which know? You know, you've, now they you've can't do that in every country. People like Google and Facebook have been have been dabbling with that for, for yeah. years. What, what, you know, what, what you know, if you force yeah. companies to Tip. contribute to the cost of building a network, why wouldn't they just build one themselves in key markets or something? Well, they're already building the submarine cables. They do, yeah. yeah. They're and this, that. Well, this is the other thing. This is why this argument about you contribute to our stuff. Well, they build submarine cables. They build data mm. centers. They use huge them? amounts in infrastructure. It's it's a sort of, there's not an equivalence there. It's, it's just odd, the whole It's It's really right? tricky. And, and, and Dario was definitely touching on this when he's quite rightly, you know, weighing up sort of both sides of the argument. You know, to, to have the sort of Scott Pacino TM, I'm a free market, laissez-faire kind of guy moment. <laughs> Be <it> smiling. <laughs> um, you know, you can't be absolutist about these things uh, because 
being um, being sort of laissez faire and pro sort of light touch regulation is to incline yourself towards a very sort of Darwinian survival of the fittest kind of thing, which again, in principle, I'm with. You know, why should someone be rewarded for being shit? But in practice, if you allow survival of the fittest, you'll end up with this one alpha predator, just absolutely owning everyone else. So there have to be protections within that. So it's, it, it is more nuanced. And, you know, and if and if governments want all these networks and they think it's a, a, a strategic priority and, you know, I don't feel too sorry for operators. I think on the whole, Ian, you, you're more of a with the numbers, but the operators still do all right. Well, they're still profitable, but they're, but they're, they're, they're heavily indebted, a lot of them. Uh, yeah. they've, they've sold off. I mean, look what's happened since they 5G licensing came yeah. along. They've spun off towers. They've, they set, I mean, Italy's, you know, they're talking about, there's the whole Telecom Italia discussion about what happens to the fixed line network there. Um, you know, there are, Vodafone's basically sold its, you know, separated its towers into another company called Va yeah. Vantage. And I think Deutsche Telekom's doing the same. You go back even a couple of years, and Nick Reed was like, no way, there's no way we'll sell a controlling stake in that. And I think there's now talk about, JVs and, and maybe even seeding yeah. control. You know, Deutsche Telekom at one stage was, we'd never sort of, they were really opposed to even the idea of sort of, of selling anything in it. And they've sort of changed their tune on that. You've got network sharing happening increasingly. There's all these ways they're trying to get on top of the financial issues they've got. Um, and, and and it's interesting because then you think, what, where is the end point of it? Because if you if you go back far enough, you said, well, you, you sold your... Uh, Headquarter and lease it back. Yeah, peaceful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I did. It's not strategic asset. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then you start selling your car, your fleet, and the, and, yeah. and lease it back, and then. You know, we moved on onto the towers and the fiber core, yeah. and, and surely the next one, which well, partially happened already, is the data center. Why does yeah. the service provider need to operate a data center anymore? So let's get rid of this. And mm. then, and then they're sharing the actual active equipment as well now. And so then you think, w what is a service? And you're provider? getting yeah. AWS to do most yeah. of your shit for you. And whatever. then eventually they just become what call centers or something. And it's you just know, a brand. Uh, it's almost like a sort of price comparison website type thing, like an insurance company <laughs> eventually. And there's nothing. Yeah, that's the extra it. that's the extrapolation. So anyway, I mean, I don't know. Like to go full circle on this, I don't think any of us claim to sort of have the answer. I I'm instinctively opposed to their calls for what is exceptionally what is effectively an exceptional tax on on uh, big tech. To help them, because I, I, I'm completely convinced by Dario's analogy of the the data is not pushed by them; it's pulled by us. Um, so, if you're <laughs> going to tax anyone, you should tax consumers. But obviously, that has political implications. Like I was just there, chatting. It's not the right time. To do that. It's not the right time <laughs> at all, is it? Oh, um, yeah. I was just chatting to some of my mates about this. You know, we've got this windfall tax on on energy companies, which you can see some justification for because uh, because of because of the international cost of gas and oil they're making a shitload of cash as a minor bt sh sh bp shareholder i can i can confirm that um and and obviously we've got cost of living which is why they're doing it you know everyone's feeling skin everyone's already i don't know i'm already shaking myself about next winter I'm just going to buy... Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy shares in a jumper company. Because everyone's going to have to wear about four jumpers this winter. Basically, you just want to get a lot of firewood in your house and, and like, have a little wooden, like, a stone firewood. area where you can sort of set... Yeah, set and it'll just sit around if you're, like, middle ages. the windows open. Come to the office every day. Get a smoke detector. Come to your, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not this studio. I hope, I hope the AC... The, the studio's pretty nippy at the moment. The AC's gone mental. Do you remember when we had um, when Neil McRae and everyone was really hot? Yeah. I don't think I we think had this I level AC then. Give it a few years, it would become a, a, a employee benefit. You can select three days in the office, keep warm. <laughs> Not true. in our company, obviously, <laughs> in general. No, well, good luck, good luck getting a hot desk in this company. Good luck giving too much internal shit away. It's pretty hard to find a desk. Anyway, um, so, yeah, it's, I suppose, it, to take it on a broader current affairs thing, having framed it that way, there's there's this demand for for money, but where do you get it from? As you quite rightly say, Dario, getting it from consumers right now is not cool. Everyone's feeling skin, and they're going to get skin to um, this winter. That's for sure. God knows what it's going to be like this winter. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not on the bread line, but I'm worried about it. We like uh, St. Petersburg in World War Two, right? In what sense? <laughs> 
cold and people start eating each other. <laughs> Cheerful, huh? Yeah. Well, That's quite. my forecast. That's my analyst forecast. Is the door closed? The door. Start, <laughs> I'm going to start tapping up my fat mates a bit more. Um, but um, so yeah, so raising the tax bigger than me. Yeah, actually, yeah. I'm talking about fat mates. I am the fat That's, mate. That would do. <laughs> and the fat mate, Ian and Ian Darrow, giving me giving me looks in advance of this winter. Um, and so you can't so you can't tax punters at least not um in in a lot of the world right now because we're all feeling skint and i presume this isn't just a uk thing i i i follow quite a few podcasts they talk about the states they've got really high inflation there i don't know to what extent you guys um Dario and pierre sort of keep in touch with current affairs in in the, the countries of your birth but presumably this applies across the board across the board yeah it's a global issue it's a global issue yeah yeah a combination of of all the inflation that came from the from the lockdowns and then the Ukraine thing, bit of a perfect storm, isn't it? To use cliche, um, so you can't do that. As you say, if you start trying to tap up big tech, they weren't born yesterday. They're very smart, very very savvy people. They're going to go, oh, well, what's in it for us? And and then it becomes a sort of geopolitical bit of aggro with the states. If you start getting too moody with Google or Amazon or whatever, the the American government will start sticking up for them at some stage, presumably. So, uh, do we have, do we have any solution to the the conundrum we were just talking about, which is that we want more investment in infrastructure, it and it's not coming now. Where does it come from, Ian? Do we have a solution? You're on the spot. You can say no. Well, I wouldn't be in this room if I had the solution. I'd be making a lot of money somewhere <laughs> as a VC. <laughs> I mean, I, no, because and that's what people are talking about at the moment. Um, obviously, so there isn't a, an easy there isn't an yeah. easy answer to it. Uh, unfortunately, it's how do you feel about uh, how do you feel about taxing um, big tech a bit more? I mean, I, I think it has to be done in a. I don't like this idea of big tech contributes to the cost of networks because you know our business models are crap and we haven't. I mean, there's a lot of problems that exist in telecom that are sort of created by. The, the companies themselves actually not being particularly innovative when it comes to business models and regulators being very short-sighted, I think. And and they're now, because of that, they seem to be saying, you know, I'm no friend to monopolistic big tech, you know, or oligo oligopolistic big tech. Um, and I do think it needs to be better regulated. But I certainly d don't think this, you know they can pay for the network simply because we've created this problem is like the answer you yeah. know proper taxation i totally agree with like what daria was talking about you know this i don't like this you know offshore havens and being able to move your money around because you're an international business and, yeah. you, and you can that's do, a piss take it's illegal also, it's illegal. telecom They're operators did that it's not uh, totally it's yeah. not a, no a company big should tech. be able to yeah, do not, that there's no, no company that can claim to be yeah. no but uh, i think, I think amazon's with big, ever made any profit in its whole with, life with big it? tech it's become it's a bit more um uh, egregious maybe because they're you know they, they have their headquarters in the us and they're international companies with pr with a presence everywhere and they've been able to kind of uh, avoid paying tax in a lot of these countries where they make a huge amount of money and I think that's where some of this comes from um, and that needs to be addressed and lot, I think lots of other things need dealing with I think there needs to be some kind of equivalence when it comes to regulating their communications company themselves yeah it, it, it is unfair that operators I think the whole licensing thing for me is a bit ridiculous actually this Maybe. it's never been as ridiculous as it was in the days of 3G but what happened in Italy even during the 5G you don't want spectrum auction yeah totally yeah, yeah. you know I mean at least in the US they get it they get in it Italy I called it an, an orgy um, of bidding <laughs> you know, but, that, but that's exactly the, the, the point I was trying to make before you cannot win everywhere as a government slash regulator. You cannot, you know, get so much from the licenses and have prices, retail prices so depressed and not let differentiation on, on uh, let's say, the slicing or, or, or the net neutrality. Uh, and because somewhere, you know, maybe a little bit everywhere, we need to give in. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, which is probably the most likely scenario, we see government directly putting their cash into the network, as we can see it happening in many European um, recovery funds. In the US, similar. In Italy, you've just read about seven, I can't seven billion or something. Yeah, seven billion. Yeah. So we see governments directly 
pouring money into the business, which, because it's critical infrastructure, is a matter of national security and, and, and so on and so forth, which is a, true and important, but there is a way of making this work commercially. Today, that way is not per far from per perfect. Yeah. Um, and somewhere, probably everywhere in all the things we, need, we mentioned, to be a bit more uh, kind of fair, or unfair to everybody, um, <laughs> we need <laughs> even handed. <clears throat> yeah, we we need to intervene. But well, I agree with you. I, I don't. While kind of morally, I kind of think that somehow uh, internet companies need to contribute more. I don't think asking them directly uh, is uh, is the right way of doing it. I I I, I would be more in favor of seeing. Uh, their contribution being done on commercial basis. Yeah, I, th I, yeah. I agree. I think um, I think having them, I think sorting out some of these tax issues, you know, having them properly regulated on a country basis, and then maybe easing some of the regulation on the on the operators themselves. I'm not saying necessarily that means it's a free for all and you can merge with everybody and we have one operator per country. But I certainly think that some of the some of the regulation in Europe is too onerous, I think, on... I mean, certainly things like net, network slicing, I think that there's even a discussion about that, Frank, is quite ridiculous. They're talking about wanting to provide, you know, um, differentiated services in a particular environment and that we're having having to have a discussion about net neutrality and maybe that's not allowed. I just think you, you, you're kind of upsetting one opportunity they've got maybe to do something a bit different and... Um, yeah. So I think for me, it's it's looking at things like that and less onerous regulation, but also making sure that the internet companies are properly regulated would maybe solve some of these well, issues. Well, that's, that's one of the big part of it, isn't it? And they're trying to play catch up on that. You know, one of my worries, I think I might have, um, I think I might have, no, do you know what? I didn't mention this in the pod. I mentioned it when we had lunch with uh, Phil from Nokia. Right at the end of it, do you remember we started talking about like sort of internet economy and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my worries, I, I, I presumably said it on the pod, I've certainly articulated it in my stories, is that, you know, in, in the States and in the UK and presumably in the EU, in fact, you see evidence of it in the EU, there is a push to regulate this big tech harder and they're kind of playing catch up. You know, there was a Wild West thing. There was a time where Facebook, Google, Amazon, etc., were allowed to just sort of run rampant and just give it a go. And to us, it's hard to argue with because they've got that business model of giving away shit for free. Yeah. Um, and there's that cliche which rings true, which is if if you can't, if you're not paying for it, then you're the customer. Um, right. And and it is true, but then people didn't mind, and I still don't to a certain extent. I mean, some people get really precious about data privacy, and I get it, and 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 they should. But you know, I use Gmail, I use this, that, and the other. Um, Google probably knows what I'm going to do before I know. Who could probably just which come and it, get inside in my head? Which is a worry. Yeah. Which is a worry, a, yeah. a distinct worry. But I've always, as a, <laughs> this is a weird way of putting it, a consenting adult. <laughs> Sounds a bit sexual. I consent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I consent to get Every fucked time. by Google. Um, <laughs> uh, as a consenting adult, I've just sort of gone, yeah, all right, well, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm doing it with my eyes open. You've still got more of yours in there. You've got two of them. Look. I'm going to try a hazy chain right. because I haven't had one today. Um, I've gone, by the way, have have quick, a hazy journey every day. quick tangent, I've gone back into the heavy gravity that we still got from when um, uh, oh, wow. Neil McRae and, and Richard Fogg was here, which is 6.5%, and whenever that's come on, we've six gone, oh, fucking hell, that's hardcore. And that's still about half of the bad boy we're having last week, so that puts it into context, doesn't it? Well, the bad boy last week didn't really get drunk, did it? Well, you had a late run on it. Not, not surprised you felt a bit dodgy on Tuesday. Yeah, but that was also because of all the booze we had at the pizza place <laughs> later it. on, I think. <laughs> We went out. We went out for dinner afterwards, and uh, I sort of misjudged, and I ordered a bottle of wine. And Dario had a little glass of just drinking water, and I came, "Do you want some wine, Dario?" And just lobbed it into his water, and he's like, "Cheers, Scott. That's what I really want. Some fucking diluted wine." Uh, he actually, he was he was much more polite than that, but yeah, that's just my my bad. Sorry, Dario. It's okay. Um, I'll, I'll accept I, your apologies. Thank you. <laughs> what was I just saying before we went off on that? Um, you were saying the world to rights. Oh yeah, no, I was just saying how I'm, I'm, I'm willingly, I'm willingly sort of sell my soul to big tech because they give me so much shit for free. Yeah, and it's a kind of a sort of Faustian deal, isn't it? But, but this but is why paid, people don't worry paid about it as well. 
Yeah. You know, and the fact that advertisers uh, pay for it, it goes into the price. Yeah, of but the I don't pay directly. There isn't exchange of money. Like I don't even have that Google one. But do you think extra people are, are worried about this in the way that we? I mean, we're talking about it because we work for a, a, a company that's in the information business, and we have to think about things. Or we're supposed to think about things, and we're talking telecom. And but do you think the average punter who's subscribing to, you know, who probably is, is, is in contact with Amazon every single day and Apple? And uh, probably have more interactions with those companies than, than mm. anybody else. And you know they get their they get their vi- video streaming and they're paying eight quid a, a month for it. Do you think they they sort of sit there and worry about the power of big tech the way that that we do? Because I'm not sure they do. And that's one of the problems, isn't it? Sort of if you, no, if, you, if, you if you serve it up to people and they they lap it up, but they don't think about the kind of but I think now and, like yeah. we were just talking about earlier with like the cost of living and how I'm cutting back on some of my subscriptions yeah now it's probably happening it's probably going to be a bit of a reckoning there's probably going to be a global recession and there's going to be some companies going to the wall a bit I think we're probably going to about to embark on about a year or two of realignment I think I do, but I don't think people mm. made the logical connection. Like the stuff in, you know, about Apple not paying enough tax in Ireland or whatever, or Facebook being oh, yeah. generally evil. And most and, people are not into and that. And they're snooping on you. And I think people, no, I think people read those stories in The Guardian or whatever it might be, and they get horrified. Well, everyone gets pissed off about massive companies then, not paying tax. But then definitely. they carry on using Facebook anyway. It's, and they carry yeah, yeah, on using them point. anyway. It's yeah. kind of interesting if you try and explain VR to, to someone who doesn't has never tried it. And but you explain VR from the opposite angle, from the angle of the of the VR washing your eyes. And so, so you have this really cool thing that is watching your eyes constantly and is monitoring the size of your pupil. And every time you see something that is interesting, your pupil kind of <clears throat> changes inside and you move without knowing and they know exactly what you like. Yeah. I'd, I'd never thought of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you describe or, it to someone that way, yeah. you know, they go like... Or smart, so smart speakers being <laughs> smart, you know, listening yeah. devices. The smart speaker yeah. bit, no, I'm but fairly... But, but I, I get it. It's really yeah. cool. You try a VR yeah. headset and you think, wow, this is, this is really amazing. I love it. And we can do so many good things. But then... You know, you, you don't, you know, you, until you watch it from the other side or you describe it from what happens on the other side, you don't really realize that, you know, a VR headset knows you much better than you yeah. know yourself. Yeah. yeah. I've, got, I've got one more thought on that and I better move it on because we've been going, how long? Yeah, over an hour? Hour and 12 minutes. Hour and 12, there we go. Um, is... Uh, uh, a little while back, before Pierre and Ian went to um, the States, m- me, Ian and Andrew were out at the pub, and Ian had some cash, and he wanted to pay for a pint with cash. Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you. Um, <laughs> you can if you want. <laughs> I, I did lose my temper, yeah. He got a bit stroppy. But yeah. what, but you got a bit stroppy, but I I, I get where you're getting from, coming from, because I think I might have mentioned on the pod a little while back, I went out with an old mate of mine, he's really cashy. Mm. He just wanted to pay in cash, and in the end, he just chucked me twenty quid, and I paid the bill on my. Well, I think I ended up having to go at the wrong person, which was the. Oh bar, yeah, that, the, bar, the bar, Yeah, bar, that's fine, but that, um, that, that's not but... the thing I want to bring up. <laughs> Although I do agree that if if you're annoyed, uh, you know, but this, but this is one of the problems we have when we're dealing with massive companies. Our only point of contact is someone on minimum wage who's yeah. got no policy setting. But if we've got the arsehole, then that's the person that we're going to vent at. So that's fine. I've got some sympathy. But the point I want to bring up wasn't how stroppy you got, <laughs> is um, the, that was the second pub that night where they'd said, we've now got a no cash policy. Yeah, although at least at the first pub, there was a big sign There's on the bar sign. saying, we don't accept cash. Yeah. Uh, whereas the one that we went into where I lost my temper, they didn't say that, and I paid, bought the round, and then offered the 20, yeah. and it's like, sorry, we don't take cash. And it's like, well... And then I got an eye because I ended up paying well, for I, it. Well, I, yeah, but I, I mean, I was I was hoping to sort of, I suppose, in my drunken appeal to them. Well, it's just ridiculous that you, you know, at least you should say or have some kind of notice on the bar, not just assume. Yes, you do not have any car on you. I did, but it's not did, the point. He had a bunch it? of cash. It's, he it's to legal pay. tender, and I wanted—I had a twenty-pound note that I wanted to use to get rid mm. of. If you order something, and is, who are they to decide that they're not going to take cash when it's legal tender in the country? It is. And, I, and that's it's where like I they could say, "Sorry, we don't take cards anymore. We only want payment in pigs from now on." Yeah, you know, and, and, that, and, <laughs> and it's like drink. such an arbitrary thing. And it's like, well, you know, I'm sorry, mm. but that's not allowed. I'm, I'm allowed to pay in this yeah. this form of currency. Yeah. This is this is what the government. And it can get really dystopian. You can imagine there being this sort of two 
new tier thing where it's like the handmaid's tale. I keep using that yeah, book as a well, reference. Well, you get these dissidents that just go off and go to a cash only place. It's like a speakeasy, and they're yeah. all doing it on the sly. Have you read the Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood? I haven't. So it's like I'm a aware. dystopian. She's yeah. a feminist, but and it's set in some. There's a, there was a series made of it, I think. As yeah, well. yeah, with the, with the funny yeah. hats. And um, and it's set in a dystopian alternative, well, future where. Uh, women are sort of second-class citizens and they're just treated as sort of, you know, sex slaves, basically, and for breeding. But yeah. it all starts off with everything's gone... She read it years ago, this is an 80s book, but everything had gone cashless. And all of a oh, sudden, right. women found out they couldn't use their cards to pay for anything. And their money had been moved into their, their partner's accounts and things like that. So she sort of... She sort of... Um, you know, imagined the, the the cashless revolution, if you like, but then mm. took it a further step as well, a sort of, well ahead of point, point of control. You know, you can't even... I mean, cash in your pocket's quite a liberating thing. You totally. can give it to a beggar, you can do whatever you want with it. No one can no one can monitor you with it. They don't know what you're doing. Tax the eyes of know. big state. I mean, in a democracy, maybe we don't worry about it, but where do things I go? Do. Where, well, yeah, this democracy is maybe one we, we should worry as, about. When you're as tinfoil <laughs> hatty as I am, you worry about it. Um, no, I mean... So yeah, and that's the reason. That's the same reason I brought it up, is um, you know I've brought it up several times in this pod. The way, in the context of Russia, America was able to just say, "Okay, no visa and Mastercard for you, then, motherfuckers," and that's just a hell of a power for America to have that switch. It can flick because Visa and Mastercard happen to be American <coughs> companies. So this is me going full circle into the, you know, uh, what, what should be the contribution of, of American big tech to all this stuff. They have an inordinate amount of power. If Google decided to cut me off because I'd said something that didn't align with its values, that's the corporate thing, isn't it? Yeah. Which is such a nebulous thing by itself. You know, let's say I said I love Donald Trump or uh, I'm in favour of... I'm, I'm far to one side of one culture war thing. And they just went, well, then you're a bad person, we can cut you off. That's an incredible amount of power they got, and that should be regulated. That's where I'm not laissez-faire. That should obviously be regulated, because it's still a source of power. Just as government should be accountable to the electorate and should be accountable to um, scrutiny by the press, so should any other major form of power. And big tech is definitely another major form of power. And, and, that, you know, and that's another classic example. If, if we've now got to the stage where increasingly you can't even spend the cash you've got in your pocket, it's fucking yeah. ridiculous. So anyway, that's you're going to get me all annoyed about it again, so that when we go out later, you're already I'm getting gonna, the arsehole. Gonna, gonna to something yeah, about you it. cannot, you cannot refuse to to accept a legal tender. Well, but they have. The so they're, but yeah. they're, so many places have done this now, and it's not just pubs. It's it's lots of venues that you go to where you can't use cash anymore. And you know, if you get paid in cash, let's say you're a so I, I a friend of mine's a tennis coach, for instance, and his colleagues tend to be his colleagues, his clients tend to be people who. It's all Battersea Courts. They're people from Chelsea, and they they they're bankers, and 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 they pay him in cash all the time. He very rarely gets money transferred, so he has. But I'm sure he still pays tax on every penny of it. Without well, I, I, don't, well, I mean, <laughs> the point is, he me. he often just wants to be able to go with money in his wallet and get lunch and use the cash mm. he's been given because it's not been paid into a bank account, and then all of a sudden he can't do that. Now that. How's that right? Yeah, no, it's bullshit. It's just wrong. It's bullshit, and it's very dystopian. And you can imagine a time where it's quite Handmaid's Tale, where there's no cash anywhere, and everything's electronic, and everything is just a flick of a switch, either from a government or from a big tech company, yeah. away from cutting you off. And then you get into those those films that Hollywood does so well, where like you've had your identity taken away, and you're a non-person, and you can't really exist in the modern world. I mean, it's easy to see. I don't think yeah. you've got to be too well, so Alex Chi Jonesy in to China, see these things. In China, it's it's sort of at that yeah, stage well, already, isn't it, with the yeah, social credit so system. So then you get into the social credit system. We've just had, yeah. we've just had the uh, World Economic Forum thing in Davos, where they all seem quite moustache twirling and into running the fucking world. Yeah. Anyway, better not go there. This is supposed to be a telecoms, not a not an <laughs> Alex Jones podcast. <laughs> in fact, we've been banging on for a while, so I, I might move it on. I mean. We never. There was a couple of things we didn't um, talk about, Dario, when we were starting to talk about the five G thing. Um, in fact, let's do it. Let's do it very quickly. To go full circle back to about an hour ago, before yeah. we went off on all these massive tangents. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, our scepticism about five G: is it any good? Is it worth it? All that sort of thing. And, and you and you pointed out that it's it's a sort of B two B and a an efficiency thing. On the B two B side. Have you, can you think of, so, and you said that there's no killer app from a consumer side. On the B2B side, is there like, 
I mean, killer's an annoying word, but is there like a, a use case that really justifies 5G in your view? No, I guess that um, it's still in development. I, I think we we talked about slices earlier on and and there are so many dependencies there that are outside the control of service providers, starting from like, let's say the handsets on a, on a, on a SA, which means that, you know, slicing, even if the commercial part of it is is uh, is uh, challenging from from what we discussed about the um, net neutrality regulation, even technically, it's not even that easy to to implement. Um, although it is happening, um, then there is obviously the private network side of the market, which is yeah, I was going to bring that up. Which, you hear that a lot these days. We, we do, and and I think uh, Ian earlier on mentioned already that service providers are not necessarily winning in that that side of the business, which is uh, which is very true, um, and it's it's uh, something maybe we started and then we kind of took the tangent, talking about the Just way a bit. The, the, took a long tangent <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the way that um, that uh, spectrum is uh, is managed and awarded with the view of opening up the market to more players. So that the shared access, uh, <clears throat> um, the shared spectrum, is a way of of saying essentially we want players other than service providers in the market, and we want players to be pretty much anybody, either the enterprise themselves, or um, a system aggregator, or uh, in, sorry, aggregator integrator, uh, or, or um, any other technology company, including our friends, uh, big tech. Um, so that that is a bit more fragmented from, but it's not fragmented in in the sense that it's it's not happening. It's fragmented in the sense that who is owning it, but nobody's really owning it mm. because who is owning IT? Quite. It's yeah. it it is. But then there was a time when it, we might have said like Microsoft or Intel or whatever, mm. but it's much more sort of homogeneous then, now. Yeah, but then you bring it back to service providers and. Uh, and it's and you see that the discussion is incredibly similar to the discussion or the market dynamic uh, of the one of IoT, where you know you have connectivity in the middle, but then you have the hardware on the left and the and the applications on the right, and service providers need to move both on the left and on the right of their traditional business model, uh, which they cannot do on their own because the market is too big, and then they need to do it in partnership, and some they need to do some acquisition. It's it's really a long process. Mm, yeah. it, it, and it and it's a process that is about transforming quite radically what they do and what they know how to do it's this is not i, I think that one of the problems with the whole like b2b thing for, from my perspective is that you to do a mass market consumer service you know you're serving tens of millions of people with the same sort of you know three or four offers and and to go into this really fragmented b2b market where you know, you need some automotive expertise perhaps for this particular use case, or you need some healthcare expertise for that one. And some of them are quite small opportunities. It might just be a couple of campuses perhaps in the country. And are they necessarily the best, you know, organisations to be the front role for that? Or is it someone like Accenture where they actually have, you know, automotive knowledge or something? And it, it's it's not clear to me that they can do anything really other than just be connectivity players where perhaps they're not making very much money from it anyway and it's not going to be a transformative thing for them but yeah um, but the, yeah the, 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 this is uh, this is why i mentioned it it's it's almost an it if you think yeah. about the private network private the size of the private network opportunity like globally and next five years is probably six billion five g four five g private networks and, but then if you compare it to the size of, of what enterprises, of, of the spending of enterprises on all IT stuff, okay, some is more traditional, but some is, is transformational. It's, we're talking about three trillion. So, so, so it, the scale of that yeah. is, is um, it, it's uncom it, you cannot even compare these two businesses. But what is interesting is that maybe uh, the 5G is is almost part of the package when you address uh, uh, either horizontal or a vertical opportunity. It's uh, 
because then we talk about the verticals all the time but then we always forget to say that yes that this these are the verticals and we all keep talking about you need to verticalize but then you look at what applications are used within the verticals and mm. then you, you find some common ones right such that's as, what i mean because i sometimes and we talk about this <clears> a lot within informa we talk about verticals and horizontals and sometimes I'm like what the fuck are you going on about but <laughs> honestly it's 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 spaghetti it's and it's lasagna <laughs> what diagonals yeah exactly <laughs> well we're playing chess here um, <laughs> and my understanding and, and Dara you might have a better understanding of this than I do my understanding verticals you're talking about industries like you know agriculture yeah. transport logistics heavy industry whatever yeah. And then horizontal is more sort of business functions. Uh, applications. That right? that's, applications. How, that's how I feel when you talk about brownfield and greenfield. I'm like, what right. the fuck is that? I do understand that. Brownfield, brownfield stuff that's existing. already been built on greenfield is, is a grass. fields. Yeah. So as, as in ground, as in it's already buried underground. So it's already no, there. so it's like redeveloping somewhere that's already fucked up. Whereas so greenfield brown. is just a fresh field. Uh, okay. Greenfield, you're having to get but it, cows but it out of the way. But it gets used in a casual way to mean, for instance, Rakuten's a greenfield network because yeah, it's a yeah. new network being rolled out, mm. whereas BT would be a brownfield case. Just, use case. It has bad no, but I get your point. Yeah. Brown sounds like shit to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, exactly. that, and that's the implication. I don't want to go in a brownfield. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Who'd want to go to Brown? It's like um, it's like uh, Reservoir Dogs. I don't want to be Mr. Brown. <laughs> I got ten <laughs> guys. They all want to be Mr. Black. Yeah. Or oh, Mr. Pink. He doesn't want to be Mr. Pink. Yeah. Or yeah. The, oh, like Steve Steve Bush- Bush- yeah. Oh, he wants yeah. to be Mr. Pink. Yeah. Oh, I thought Mr. Actually, Brown... you look like with your suit. You look like you could be in the movie. I know. That was the idea. It's like Reservoir. You look like want... Mr. Pink. <laughs> That's what he said. Anyway. He said. You look like Mr. Pink. But you know, having having um, decoded. Vertical and horizontal. No, uh, right, to give you an example, so yeah. we, we we talk about the opportunities in this vertical, and that vertical, and the other vertical. But there's there is something that is apart from the network that is always or almost entirely always used in any case is, for instance, machine vision. You always have cameras analyzing patterns and giving you insights. And you always have data analytics. So those are in some ways. Horizontal and consistent keyboard. across yeah. industry, and they are consistent yeah. across industry. And then it's quite su- surprising that there is so little done by, uh, including service providers, to really invest and in, in that kind of uh, uh, expert. I guess maybe machine or some part of the machine vision is very commoditized, so they don't need to acquire it. They can, they can just use it as and when needed. But it's. Um, I, I I agree with you. Uh, we talk about these verticals, as I w- and you say, "What the fuck is the vertical?" I I get it, <laughs> because uh, the vertical. I mean, what is the agriculture vertical? Mm. Are you talking about the huge farm, or are you talking the a, a tractor, um, mm. like the one who was uh, your MP the dominator? Was, yeah, dominator <laughs> five thousand. <000. laughs> <laughs> or, or are you talking about a small farm in a rural village? Uh, or are you talking yeah. about niche porn? I mean, it's a fine line, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, quite. Okay. Well, like, so going back into the five, yeah, yeah, the, into the five years, yes, it, it's um, it's very much for the enterprise, but it's not uh, it's not only for service providers, quite quite clearly because of the spectrum, and it's not only a network business because of. Uh, the reason why you're doing all of this is to essentially transform enterprises or industries or businesses, um, make them more efficient. Most of them are brownfield, so it's, it's, you're not deploying a you network. Go, yeah. from, you're not deploying a network from scratch. You're you're adding to existing uh, technology, so it, it does add complexity, which all points towards the direction that. What you mm. really need is applications and system integration capabilities. I see IT. Look at Telecom Austria. Was it this week or today or yesterday? I don't remember. They made an acquisition of, a, of a, probably the largest um, IT, I would say, integrator in Bulgaria. So th- this is where service well, providers are that. going. Yeah. Did they? I missed that one. Yeah. Yeah, I think I saw that when I was desperately searching for news today. <laughs> I, I mean, it's quite relevant. Quite I know it's niche in yeah. terms of... Yeah. Well, do you know, actually, you know, just like an inside baseball thing, being a journalist, sometimes you've got to cover the niche stuff. You know it's not going to get that many reads. We can get addicted to reads, and we might want to cover sort of massive M&A. In fact, there's been some M&A re- this week that we, we've run out of time to cover. But sometimes covering the niche stuff pays off. Yeah. And that is supposed to be our job, you know, if you're like a trade press. 
Um, but anyway, okay. So, I mean, in summary, before I move it on, what we seem to be saying is it's complicated. Uh, perhaps more than ever before, 5G is complicated in terms of what is the point of it. And yeah, maybe I can sometimes be a bit glib and go, it's all been a waste of time. And, you know, that's just part of how I talk and also part of the journalistic sort of reductive way in which we look at things. Um, but it is complicated and it's especially complicated for service providers, for want of a better term, to work out what to do with it. So I guess we've got to be a little bit patient I think one of the things that probably makes me impatient is the uh, marketing departments of said service providers where they always want to push it and say 5G is the best thing since sliced bread and all that sort of thing. And it clearly isn't for a lot of people, especially consumers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've still, we're only 2022. We're halfway through 2022, isn't it? Why, why are you smirking? What have I done? Uh, it's your, your funny sort of anti-5G oh, okay. thing. Well, it's not just me. You come out with it plenty of times. Well, I love it. I love a bit of <laughs> Best thing that's ever happened to you. We all love I it. hope your wife's not listening to this. <laughs> or your kids. Yes. Anyway. Um, I'm just trying to wrap it up. I'm just trying to move it on, right? I'm just trying to be professional. Um, I do like the idea of 5G broadband. What, in what sense? The you mean like fixed wireless access or just getting your broadband for 5G and not involving a fixed line at all? What do you Second mean? option, yeah. Second one, right. The way, like, oh, I'm moving houses, I oh, just carry this device. Yeah. But it's never going to be as yeah, good as fixed. Yeah, that would be handy, which is what 3 says you can do with their yeah. service. It's pretty cheap compared to some fixed line, though. Mm. Yeah, well, in fact, we didn't really talk about FW, but it's another yeah. really interesting one. It's, yeah. um, you know, it was hyped, dismissed, and now it's coming back. <coughs> as a, probably somewhere in between the hype and the dismissed but it's certainly very prom promising i mean even T uh, we're talking about us you know t-mobile had a million uh devices fwa devices very recently really? announced yeah. that's that's well, huge like the, 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 the company that i heard making the biggest deal of it was orange in romania one year when we were both there dario and then they went and bought a fixed line operator <laughs> instead <laughs> it is true but when we talk about fwa Sometimes I like to remind people that maybe some, in some cases, the same people that many years ago would tell at conferences, yeah, you may, maybe you use your mobile phone to text your little friends, but you never call the pizza delivery using your mobile phone. You will always pick up the phone you have in your house yeah. and that will never go. I do it on the internet, so I don't have to deal with a human being at all. But exactly. I mean, it, wireless is eating the world. I'm sorry. Yes, fixed broadband is there. Yes, fiber is, is really incredibly important. But nobody likes to have wired stuff they, they anywhere. The, the last uh, fixed Manhattan uh, phone booth the pay phone, this week. Yes. Yeah. Is it? it went it's going to be in a museum now. Yeah. I did, like Romania, small museum. Hmm? I did like Romania. I did like Romania. And if Orange is listening, I'd be quite happy to go there again. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, no. You're begging it, for trips. Al Alba Iulia, wasn't it? Alba Iulia. It was yeah, uh, really a nice. Cruz, a Cluj Napok, I think. Yes. Yeah. I remember but, when that happened. I think, did Jamie get to that? Anyway, I remember. I remember but no, but the, the point there, is, yeah. if the fibre is there, yes, absolutely. But when it's not there, you need a lot of uh, interim solutions uh, and before we fiber up the entire planet and every single base station and every single house and every single room, according to some, and every single business, there will be a lot of interim stuff that we need to do using wireless and maybe satellites too. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I'm just throwing it there to <laughs> open well, no, up. Uh, you're right. And um, and the analogies of, of, of the past kind of... Uh, uh, skepticism about you know the business of of wireless versus the wireline are all there you just go back into your uh, notes from conferences where they say oh this moron say that um you will always use your fixed line phone haha -ha. uh, <laughs> because you know you can see what happens yeah. <clears throat> and it's just uh, um it, and and to prove that you know look at he, even here in, in the UK, where we have a decent, <coughs> more or less decent fixed line um, coverage, they're all adding up 4G backup to your, for, to your uh, fixed line. Yeah. Or, you know, you can have a better fixed line service if there I was, add a 4G backup to your modem. There was an article to, to, we did this week, actually, where I think it was BT 
<coughs> offering some kind of premium or relatively <coughs> premium business service where they couple fixed and mobile together yeah. to sort of augment uh, each other. Bonding. Bonding. That, that was what Huawei used to be talking about sort of yeah. five years ago. But it's ago, not necessarily bonding. 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 Yeah. I don't, I've never never quite got it, but um, yeah. oh, once you try bondage, you never go back. <laughs> Trust you, bring it to conversation. <laughs> <laughs> go for the Dominator Five Thousand. <laughs> right on that but, note. On that note, we should wrap it up. I mean, th- no, the thing you bring up at the end there, Daria, is a good point. I mean, to position you as the five G guy. Obviously, that's just absolutely core of what we talk about, and we could have a separate podcast on each of the things that you just spoke about now. And maybe we will. You're obviously welcome back any time. Thank you. I'm but I'm going to have to. Yeah, yeah. I'll let you decide I'm whether that's joking, good yeah. for your career yeah. to do that. Um, but we better move it on because we've been banging on for ages. Um, and Pierre's probably got something to do. It's grown up. Um, so I'm going to hand the ball over to Ian earlier on today, which is why you're wearing oh, this yeah. suit. And he just thought, oh, fuck, yeah. I thought that was it. Got to <laughs> no, I'm afraid not, mate. You're not out of the woods yet. Why are you wearing the suit? You went so and met... Two-minute segment. You, yes, yeah, two-minute okay. segment. You that. went and met uh, Tommy Wito from Nokia, who said, um, he said, you've got to hold on to what you got. It doesn't make a difference if you make it or not. Anyway. What comes no, he didn't line? say that. Um, uh, we've, we've got, got each, each other, other but not a lot. lot. For love. Yeah, there we go. We'll give it a shot. Whoa. Do, 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 do. Uh, me. All right, I think I've really laboured that joke. Someone needed to sing it, though, really, rather than just... No, no, I'm, I'm no John Bon Jovi. No. And haven't often been confused for him. No, you don't have the, you don't have the hair. No. Well, I did. I showed you that photo of when we went and saw Whitesnake. I was wearing my flat hair. Mm. You know, I have a killer John Bon Jovi impression. I'll do it after right. the podcast. <laughs> no... It's lifelike. He's going to have to start doing some of his impressions. impressions I know, I do shit podcast. impressions on the pod. Yeah, he's got Ethan Hawke and John Bon Jovi now in his <laughs> repertoire, and we've never seen either of them on the pod. Uh, <coughs> Ethan Hawke one, I seem to remember, is like um, Matt oh, Damon in Team America, where they just do Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> you spoilt it. I'm sorry, oh, well, he won't do it. I haven't spoiled anything. No one's ever going to hear it. It's too much of a shrinking violet. Yeah. Anyway, um, Tommy Wito, you just went and met him. He's one of the most senior guys at Nokia. He's their network's... He's a mobile guy. Yeah. So uh, what were you chatting about? I mean, it wasn't... There was no great revelation. All right, well, that's uh, that then. So let's uh, go down the pub. No, I mean, he was... They've... Um, he's almost like the recovery guy in a way, I suppose. You know, he came in after they'd had these problems on the 5G product line that were well reported. Did he? How long time. ago did he come in? Well, he took over... Um, it, he was appointed sort of end 2018... And the issues came to light in 2019 when okay. I think they were already trying to fix them. But basically what happened was they they got let down by a key supplier, which um, various analysts subsequently identified as Intel on the delivery of custom chips that they were going to be using. They weren't the, the only uh, people who got let down by Intel on chips. Huh? Apple is another one. Yeah, uh, yeah. on the delivery of... Um, sort of ASICs for baseband processing and beam forming and things that you needed that were quite critical to the sort of initial 5G products they were launching. And to deal with that problem, they, they sort of fell back on these Xilinx FPGAs, which are programmable chips, but not all, not always bad. They're good in certain environments, but if you're doing something that's kind of at, at scale, um, that's, you know, one particular sort of use mm. case, it just wasn't suitable in that. And that's what um, ASIC is, application-specific integration. Yeah, circuit. I mean, what it did for them was to really kind of chew into gross margins and, and affected their ability to compete against um, Ericsson and Huawei, which were using ASICs rather than FPGAs. Yeah. And they but, lost... But, so, they um, were, so they were both... They were both delivering better products and had lower overheads. So yeah, like I, mean, I, I don't think that was the, you know, there's there's other stuff might, that might have been going on as well. I think they sort of been distracted a bit by their merger with Alcatel-Lucent yeah. that happened in 2016 and had taken their eye off the ball a bit. But this FPGA cost issue, I mean, their gross margins were sort of really suffering and then they started to lose market share. They, they, they you know, they had setbacks stemming from this in, in China, partly geopolitical, I guess, but... Also, um, they lost a deal in um, America with um, Verizon to, to Samsung, um, and he's. I mean, the the big thing under him is to, to be to be sort of sorting out the five G product line 
phasing out these FPGAs. They brought in alternative um, chip suppliers, so they weren't sort of overly reliant on on Intel. So they're using mm-hmm. Broadcom and Marvell in kind of slightly different areas. They've still got Intel in the mix. Um, and then they had this big product refresh. Was it last year, or early last year, or maybe a bit earlier than that, where they un- unveiled this range of products that if you look at, if you talk to people like Gabriel Brown at Heavy Reading, who sort of tracks this stuff, he was like, yeah, it's on paper sort of measures up and seems to have done a really good job of turning it around. Um, but the key thing, obviously, is to is to match that to market success. Mm-hmm. And um, so his, his sort of message today is, you know, market shares obviously dipped with the losses in China and, and the US, but it's now kind of stabilised. So if, I think if you look excluding China, which I think Ericsson and Nokia both have to do now, because they're, yeah. they're just kind of not really there or a bit insignificant. It's just a matter of how irrelevant you are. Yeah, it's like 26%. Um, it's sort of stabilised at that level. Um, and Sorry, 20, what, 26% of what? 4G and 5G what? combined market share. Globally? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, and they're guiding for sort of revenue growth this year in the mobile business. I mean, he's pretty bullish on where they've actually picked up new deals. He was saying they've got 35 contracts, I think, that are just entirely new customers that they never worked with before. Um, and a lot of it's a lot of it's geopolitical. A lot of it's actually come for it's it's that's the thing. It's hard to sort of say it's necessarily to do with the fact that they're more competitive now, yeah. or whether it's because there's been this huge. Huawei swap out that's going on. So even in European markets where they've not been banned or heavily restricted, you've seen operators go to Ericsson and Nokia either because they're fearing restrictions or because the government's whispered something in their ear and they haven't published formal rules. Um, but I mean, some of the things he cited were also deals they've picked up in Canada recently with TELUS and Bell Canada, and they had their own, um, I think, Huawei ban. Was it this week or was it late last week? Kind of the air they just announced um, belatedly a Chinese vendor. Yeah, and then you're sort of saying, you're sort of thinking to yourself, well, where, so he's very much about growing market share and, and what happens in the next phase of 5G, 5G Advance, which you mentioned earlier. Um, where are their opportunities now? Because a lot, you know, you talk to some of the analysts and like, well, a lot of the deals have already been done now in Western mm-hmm. economies, developed economies. But you did point out there's a lot still to be gained. You know, like markets like India, um, Vietnam, Brazil, they're just several of the ones that he cited where they're sort of seeing an opportunity to do something. And then there's this sort of, it's quite interesting, you know, it's something I thought about a little bit, but this whole Russia situation um, where Ericsson and Nokia have now basically pulled out of Russia because of the war in Ukraine, partly to comply with sanctions, I think, but also partly for sort of reputational reasons. Yeah. It's just too much trouble to be there. And a lot <laughs> There's of not Western. much upside in hanging out of Russia. It was only 2% of yeah. their revenues. I mean, it wouldn't have been a, a, a complicated decision for them, I think. McDonald's but, completely left? Yeah, it's mm. like that. But um, but then you've got Huawei and ZTE are still reportedly there. You know, you try and get something firm out of them and it's hard, but they're still people still consider them to be operating in that market. And they certainly haven't made some um, big grand gesture saying we're Oh, well, they just, here. they won't comment if you yeah, ask yeah. them. Um, and there's and there's people who, who track this, like the Yale School of Management, for instance, which has got a sort of naming and shaming list that has not just telecom companies, but other companies operating in Russia, and they're, they're sort of on that. And um, he didn't, I mean, he didn't name them directly, but he's sort of alluding to opportunities that might come out of them being there almost so companies in other markets not wanting to be seen to be working with high-risk vendors that are still kind of in russia basically so so is your point given that in many countries most recently russia huawei and zt are are deemed too high risk to be allowed to be part of the 5g networks of their operators yeah is is the inference from that that there might be another tier of other countries that are not perhaps closely strategically aligned to the states who might start going well on the same. Well, I, th- I think there's a lot that are closely strategically aligned to the states that still haven't taken a decision. What, like Western Europe? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Vodafone, Deutsche Telekom, Orange, I'm not just so sure about Telefonica, but certainly those three, which are three of the biggest service providers in Europe, are all heavily reliant on Huawei still. Is it? The, the only market where Vodafone stripped out... Um, uh, UK. Is, is the UK in, 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 in Europe. Now, they've not been using it in the core of the network, which is considered to be the sort of sensitive control centre part, but they're, they're still heavily invested in Huawei in, in, in a lot of their European markets. Okay. Germany, in particular, is 
you look at Deutsche Telekom's network and it's all Huawei and um, and Ericsson and interestingly Nokia used to be the, the one of the main radio access network suppliers to Deutsche Telekom but they they lost that deal to Ericsson years ago back into the 2017 right well around um, the time you were alluding to where it was all going a bit peaked I mean that wasn't a, that wasn't a, a, a Huawei decision it was, no, it was no, more to do would, with yeah it was the yeah. chips and all that I mean, I'm not even sure it was to do with 5G, but they, they okay. basically were re they were replaced by Ericsson. And, um, you know, you look at uh, Deutsche Telekom's 5G network, it's it's all sort of Huawei Ericsson base stations. It, and uh, I think the other German operators, Vodafone, Telefonica Deutschland, they're very big customers of Huawei still now. And I'm not saying I would argue this myself, but you've got people out there saying you shouldn't be dealing with, with what you're basically paying money to a company that props up Putin's regime, yeah? Mm -hmm. And allows it to keep the lights on. It's that it's that kind that's, of argument that might kind of... persuade some of these operators to go, well, maybe we need to look at some of our supplier relationships. That's essentially what he's alluding to, that maybe this is a sort of second wave of opportunities that come out it's of interesting. that. So it's interesting to me that he brought that up. I'm sure he did it delicately and in a professional way. But I've always found when I've chatted to vendors and I've just sort of gone, can't have done you any harm while we're getting kicked out of everywhere. They've always wanted he's, to downplay it. He's pretty it. direct. Yeah, he's and pretty that's what, direct. And that's what I like about sort of meeting him, that he's pretty... Just gets to the point. Quite honest. And, and, and the, other, the other thing I talked to him a little bit about was Open RAN, um, which, you know, the big vendors, Open RAN's always perceived as being a threat to the big vendors. But out of the out of the the big vendors, Nokia's always been the one that's been more. We're we're sort of we're contributing. We see more this as opportunity. Definitely, completely, yeah. and and yet raised a number of massive concerns today when I met him. Oh, about really? the Cost side of it, it won't save you anything at all. You know, it's that's I don't good. you know uh, I don't see how it will. You know, the market <laughs> always gravitates. I can see to a few headline players. in that straight away. <laughs> well, I mean, this Looking might go up before I've got a chance to week. write anything, but um, that's basically my sort of Monday. Yeah, stuff. well, that's. A, <laughs> I mean, that's just obviously ringing journalistic. Hello, yeah. there's a headline. Yeah. Um, but th those are the main things yeah. I talked about. So he didn't really sort of. Um, what he wanted to talk about was five G advance, but I think we talked for fifty minutes before he got onto it. So about okay. other stuff. So, and we've uh, chatted a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, I've we've been typically undisciplined in terms of time, so we haven't got too much time to chat about that. But. Um, I certainly want to sort of give Dario one last chance to chat, but I don't know how to sort of frame up. Is there anything from what Ian was just saying that sort of sparked some thought? No, I think particularly the last, well, a couple of points. One is we have the perception that in Europe, kind of Huawei is deemed as a high risk vendor everywhere, which is legally is not in many countries. <clears throat> and, um, but certainly when, when you look at it from kind of now service providers need to factor in geopolitical risks more more than ever so it does add to the cost of doing business definitely uh, so i think there might be something there I'm, i don't know i think it some, sounds a bit of a long leap to say well because these companies are serving that country and because that country is not is doing is in, has invaded another country therefore I don't know. I think it's a bit, it's a bit of a long leap because they they are selling into at the end of the day businesses, not consumers. I I, I would get it if. We, so I mean, good good luck. Yep. If if that's if that's the way they think they're gonna sell more. Um, <laughs> that's well, I, I think he's he's mainly <coughs> hoping to sell more because he's because he's hoping that his product line is competitive. Oh yeah, I that, think. that's a bit. I mean, that's probably a bit, much better. I, I was sort of digging line. To, to comment on the geopolitics <laughs> when when he when he commented on that as a, an opportunity. He's probably going to be horrified that this has been the the, 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 the subject of a discussion. <laughs> no, but your takeaway. <laughs> yeah. but, but that's um, fine. I mean, but, uh, as I think we but, chatted about earlier on this week, I think maybe we were chatting to Phil from Nokia. You know, this is the this is a trade off when you engage with the press. Yeah. You don't get to control the outcome of that engagement. Mm. So if if his talking points going in was, you know, we're really great at this, that and the other, but what you took from it was just one bit of what he said about the geopolitical side, then you know, that's the trade off, isn't it? And he doesn't have to engage with you. And I by the way, applaud him for engaging with you. Um but it but it's a there's a risk reward thing going on there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But the the, the interesting on on the other I think in interesting point if I 
it's um, it's the open run. It, and if, if, of course, we know that all the major vendors are not particularly keen on it, yeah. even though it, Nokia seems to be a bit, bit more receptive. Although it's complicated, even even Tip themselves would admit it. It's complicated, and yeah. it's uh, and it's it's very long term. Even yeah. even Vodafone, who's probably one of the most aggressive. Uh, aggressive probably is not the right way of describing it. It's more supportive. <clears throat> uh, their their uh, timeline for implementation, I mean, we're talking about a very long yeah. uh, time frame for, a, almost, for, I would say, not a huge amount uh, and uh, and in a very long term. If, correct me if I'm wrong, probably you have more fresh mind on that. W- was it's it? 20... Well, 20, they, 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 they're trying to do it... To, yeah, they're trying to. Yeah, I don't know what what percentage of the Huawei. I mean, it's two thousand five hundred sites, and I think they have about six thousand Huawei sites in their footprint altogether. So, and that's what they've announced is going to open around so far. That's now, half. I guess if that works out, then they probably want to move the rest of them to open around as well, rather than using Ericsson or Nokia. But the timeline they have to comply with is N twenty seven for the Huawei swap out, which is quite a long time but um yeah like you say it's really difficult i mean he, he he's not sort of dogmatic about it in a weird way i think he was just pointing out i mean we've talked about the contradictions with open ran and mm. a lot of the time I mean, you know his his thing really is all this stuff about disaggregation is all very well but at the end of the day someone's got to re-aggregate he, he can't sort of said that's the expression i'm inventing is re-aggregation because you you take it all apart, someone's going to come along and actually make sure this stuff all works. He said, well, yeah. Nokia does that, <clears throat> and we get companies wanting us to do that, but you, but they're using different suppliers underneath, basically, or they do it themselves, in which case you're taking on a huge operational burden to do it yourself. Yeah. But even if, you do, even if you are using a systems integrator, you've still got that kind of choke point there, if that's what your intention is with Open RAN, to not have a, a choke point and have more diversity. And then... You know, as he said, the market's always, it's not just open RAN. We're heavily dependent on a few suppliers in all sorts of e- markets and economies, outside telecom as well. There's only three big public clouds. There's only one okay, company chipset. that sells yeah. chips that are under 10 nanometers and are really good. You know, there's, that sells 90% of them anyway, according to The Economist today. Um, so it's like, it's just a bit odd that they think they can sort of deal with this issue, this competitive issue with but is, with Open it, RAN. But know. that's the, my takeaway, and not, I'm not deep in the technology of Open RAN, is, is, is more about kind of opening up to like innovation from smaller vendors. I think, I think the whole issue that operators have with the way the RAN is today is, is that what they call innovation is reliant on a couple of vendors' production cycle. Yeah. And nothing can be inserted until the production cycle can allow it to be inserted. And it's very yeah. much selected. And all. So, so that is... But it's a trade-off, the- isn't it, then? Because then you get the low costs and you, you're talking about a mass market deployment where it's only feasible to do it that way. And that's why I think probably Open RAM will be more targeted you know maybe there's an opportunity there for it to be addressing niche cases in factory environments or something and some some companies got a radio that we can use to do this and nobody else is producing one but generally speaking you're going to want to roll out you know thousands of cell sites that are all pretty much the same thing for you and me to use our smartphones and the requirements are all the same wherever you are in the world so, so it's, yeah. yeah i i I, t- I think that's probably one of the main arguments for open well, right? uh, yeah, the innovation stuff but. other ones and i think i'm going to butt in because we're getting on for when we'd normally knock it on the head at this stage um i can see it from an operator point of view open run by itself just has offers the opportunity for them to beat up Ericsson and Nokia yeah. when they're negotiating. And they can just go, well, then fuck it. I'll go open round. I mean, whether or how much of that is a bluff well, is that's, another matter. He, he alluded to that himself. He said that there's a view that they can get more companies into the market, obviously, and then yeah. it's like you can drive prices down. But, the, but then the question is, will they survive? You know, we, mm. we used to have... He said we're basically six or seven base station companies. You know, we're a bit of Nortel, a bit of Motorola... You know, there's various that knock. There's a bit of Lucent, a bit of Alcatel. You look at all the different companies that Nokia is nowadays, and 
for you know for competitive market reasons, they all ended up going together. You look at all the paperwork, all the regulatory paperwork from 2016, when they when Nokia bought Alcatel Lucent, and the European regulator went out and canvassed operators on what their view of that merger was, which is probably the last big merger that took the market down to three players. And the main response the was, yeah. no objections, it will probably improve competition because it means there's a stronger player there and better economies of scale. Yeah. And now they're talking about... We need but to that's change. before they started turfing Chinese vendors out of everything. Yeah, but it's only, you're only talking about one or two companies. This idea that open rank yeah, yeah. this diverse seven, eight player market, you know, no, or totally. maybe you'll have a Samsung there that's stronger or an NEC. Maybe it's one or two others, but instead of Huawei, you know, possibly. No, I, but, um, I completely agree with you on that. I, I'm slightly being devil's advocate. Which probably doesn't even need open round to do that. But in some um, ways, it was almost inevitable. And you think about it when. Okay, I'm being slightly cynical here, but think about when service providers talk talk to the the investor community or publicly, they are addressing those ears as well and say, okay, so how about now you are in a situation where with a duopoly, um, how do you deal with it? And then they have this magic solution of, oh, no. Well, exactly. open, yeah. and, open, and, and the same governments, by the way, the same governments that are banning uh, uh, Huawei are, are advocating for open run and say, oh, this is, oh, I've created a commercial issue. Well, let's leave the geopolitical is- risks and, and all of that aside. But they've created a commercial issue. And so, but I've, I have a solution. Here's open run for you. And British government, um, you mm. look at the, the recent announcement of uh, the open run principles. Mm. Um, why does the government need to get into that? And that's another question. Yeah, but, yeah. But um, I actually, I actually it, interviewed uh, um, it, Julia it, Lopez when she was launching that stuff. It, it's all, it's uh, it's almost like providing some sort of explanation to an audience that maybe is not even particularly. Um, okay. Well, they see as, it as the, like you say, they see it as the way of ensuring that there's more competition, having banned Huawei, but it's. Uh, the wrong way to do it in a way like government intervention to try and it's very protectionist i think a lot of it in in certain markets it's a bit it's a bit square i, I have to wrap it up here because we're totally out of time yeah. it's a bit square peg in a round hole um it there is there is the uh there are various arguments in favor of open run and you can see from the point of view of the people who make those arguments why they're good arguments but from the holistic broad <coughs> point of view they don't necessarily stack up but um, but yeah, it's really interesting to it's, hear. It's not too dissimilar though to we need we need big chip companies in in Europe building fabs, yeah. Because oh look, TSMC is over there in Taiwan and China mm. could invade it at any minute. Well, it's the but, t- it's the top down versus bottom up thing, which you can hear explored ad nauseum in my oh, not so best selling book. book. Uh, yeah. I don't <laughs> um, but. Um, but yes, no, I mean, look, I'm knocking it on the head because this is a tangent we could go off on for ages by itself, but we've, we've got to call it a day. But I do think it's interesting, in summary, that um, Tommy Rito, <coughs> fair play to him, was being so um, frank and honest on that subject because if all he'd said is like, oh, it's fucking great, then obviously we'd be inclined as journalists to call bullshit. And I think that's the best way, if you're talking to journalists, is treat them as grown-ups and admit that there's nuance and complications to what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I ran into one of our colleagues on the way in and he said that the, um, the, the when I said that he was complaining about um, open round, he said, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? And I was like, well, actually, not really. No, they want to make themselves out to be mm. yeah. quite friendly to open round. <laughs> but only compared to Ericsson, so. I think. But that's, that's, well, that's even again, Ericsson's like, oh no, we're not against open round these days. But know. nobody is anymore. No one's against it. <laughs> well, they don't want to seem to be. Anyway, I'm going to knock it on the head there. Dario, thank you very much. It's great to have you here. You, obviously, you our me. door is always open to you. Not least because you work on the same floor of us, often, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So, well, actually, our door's not always open, as we had a couple of podcasts ago when someone tried to get in and we told them to fuck off. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was great having you. It was great chat. Thanks I hope you enjoyed it. Me. I enjoyed it cool. thoroughly. Thank you. All right, mate. Um, and I'll leave it there. So thanks a lot for listening and make sure you join us for the next one. <laughs>